If you were hurt by trauma when you were a kid, you're already painfully aware of how the old hurts and fears and triggers come back to haunt you right when you're trying to take a big step up in your career. And it's not that you're not smart enough or capable enough. It's the trauma injury inside. It can rise up sometimes and make you say the wrong thing or lose your focus or get overwhelmed and take yourself out of the running for an opportunity that you really wanted. Has this ever happened to you? It's a terrible waste of your talent. And I want to show you some strategies so that even though you have PTSD from childhood, you can show up and be strong and do great things in your work life. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people how to heal the symptoms of complex trauma from childhood so that you can free yourself from destructive patterns that maybe in the past have sabotaged your work life and held back your ability to rise up the ladder of career growth and income. I don't talk about money enough on this channel, I think, but as a person who grew up poor, I can tell you that a lack of money and fear around money can make you really vulnerable to more trauma in your life because it can pressure you to take jobs that are miserable for you and to cling to bad relationships only because you can't afford to leave. Now, our careers bring security and choices into our lives, both very important when you're setting your life up for healing from the past. Your career is also one of the ways that you express yourself, what you are, who you are, what you bring to this world and to the people around you. And when this goes well, it is in itself healing for the wounds of your past trauma. I believe we need to develop and express these gifts. And when that's blocked, and that's exactly what PTSD can do, it's miserable. It's, it's not just that you have all these symptoms, it's that you can't do what you're meant to do. And that is miserable. That's where you get the feeling that life is passing you by. Have you ever had that? When time is passing, but you're stuck outside of your life, it feels like, and the happiness you know you're capable of is like somewhere outside where you can't get to it. So that's a big part of healing from past trauma, getting your life back, becoming who you're meant to be and doing work that serves the world and that's fulfilling to you. Doesn't that sound good? Healing trauma isn't just about trying to be someone else. It's about becoming more, more of yourself. And yes, you are someone who was traumatized and you have great things to bring to this world anyway. This is your chance to not let the past limit everything about your future. What happened in the past, it's real, but what you do with your life today is even more real. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to spot where your PTSD is getting you stuck and teach you some strategies to free yourself and go further in your career than you thought was possible because the world needs you, all right? That's why we need you. So let's talk for a moment about the ways old trauma shows up in your work life. Now, in my experience, there are four main trouble spots. One is your ability to work with other people has some gaps in it. <laughs> some spots where you get triggered, especially around teams and your sense of belonging in them and around bosses and either their authority over you or trying to get their approval of you. Am I right? Have you had this? If you grew up with abuse or neglect, these ordinary aspects of working with other people, they can be just so fraught and confusing. And that can lead to you wanting to avoid people and challenges that are important to getting where you're trying to go. Or it can lead you to walk in like a deer in the headlights into work situations that repeat the abuse and neglect that hurt you in the first place. Bosses and coworkers who are bullies, manipulators, excluders, you know, the mean girls in high school. And if you grew up with this kind of thing, you might know that you need to get out of there, but it can make you paralyzed. You start to doubt yourself. And it's not rational, but that's what trauma can do. Okay. So that's the people you work with. The second way trauma can show up in your work life is in your tendency to get dysregulated around unpleasant people or just around any kind of stress or deadline pressure or self-doubt, which everybody has at work sometimes. Now you've probably heard me talk about dysregulation. It's a brain state that's common for people with childhood PTSD. Any kind of stress can make you feel spaced out, discombobulated, overwhelmed, or it can make you feel over-emotional with feelings like panic or rage or just getting upset until you cry, which is never fun at work, I happen to know. But it's especially painful when you're freaking out and you're confused about whether the thing that's upsetting you is even real, right? 
or you know it's not reasonable to be freaking out, but you can't stop. And if this has happened to you, you know there's a lot of shame wrapped up in it and that shame all by itself can stop you from being who you are and it can stop you from going for the work that you really love. So it's devastating. The third way that trauma can show up in your work life is when it crushes your brilliance. That chronic ongoing stress and intensity of having CPTSD in your brain when you don't have a way to calm it down, it just starts like robbing you of your ability to focus and it's draining you of your productivity, your enthusiasm, and it makes you feel like a dumbed down version of yourself. Have you experienced that? And of course, CPTSD symptoms create a negative cycle around money. I grew up poor, for example. My mother had grown up middle class and had a great education, but the chaos in our family around her addiction and drinking, if you have that in your family, you know how it gets wrapped up in everything and sucks the life out of it. So we were on and off welfare for several years. And when I was very little, we were hungry sometimes. And she'd go out for a while for more than a couple of days sometimes, and we'd have to find something to eat and get ourselves to school. And my clothes would be dirty and I'd have no jacket, that kind of thing. So poverty can cause trauma and trauma can cause poverty. You can break that cycle, but if you haven't done it yet, that trauma can keep getting back into your life. Trauma has a tendency to beget more trauma sometimes. You probably have experienced that. Maybe your trauma symptoms cause you to lose a job or drop out of school, or you never go for anything challenging or well-paid because of that big trauma-shaped hole in your self-confidence, or you're worried that being around people and working with them is just gonna be too triggering, or you gravitate to cruddy jobs just because you know you won't have to deal with people. It kind of helps cut short that dysregulation, but it cuts you off from learning to work with other people and deal with them, which is a big part of being successful in life as well as work. And the thing is when you're broke or struggling financially, you are extra vulnerable to re-traumatizing yourself through the choices you have to make. Staying in a bad relationship or a miserable job because you can't or, or you feel you can't make that leap to something better. So what can you do to stop the negative cycle and start taking positive steps to do the important and meaningful work that you know is inside you? I call this breaking the wheel, okay? The wheel is that hurricane of bad thoughts and feelings and actions and outcomes that just goes round and round and it can be hard to escape. You, you don't even try to climb out, just break it. That's what I'm saying. Just take a big stick and jam it in there wherever it lands. Do the thing about your trauma that is right in front of you. Make the change that's doable for you. If something's too hard, not that, do the thing that's doable. Is it taking a class? Go sign up. Is it quitting a crap job? Maybe it's time. Is it changing where you live so that you can pay down debts and start building up savings again? Yes, that's a good idea. Being economical feels good. Start where you are and change the thing in front of you. When you're healing, work can be an opportunity to grow and heal and evolve if you're engaged in healing your past trauma. For this, a few things are important, all right? One is you need a way to discharge PTSD thinking before it spills out of your mouth and into your work life. Those urgent feelings in CPTSD that would make you lash out at other people or sabotage yourself when you're upset, you can always wait a day to do that, assuming you're not in physical danger, that is. If you need techniques to get those thoughts and feelings out safely, I've got a link in the description section that you can follow for my free course. I'm always talking about it. Look for the words free course down there and I'll teach you how to calm the symptoms so that you can take smart actions from a calm and clear place. The second thing I really encourage you to give yourself for healing trauma is support. Now, maybe this is a therapist, maybe it's a trusted friend, um, a 12-step sponsor or a group who can be your sounding board when you don't know if you're being abused or just running through an old emotional loop. It goes both ways, right? And to learn discernment, it helps to have gentle feedback from somebody you trust. The third thing is practice recognizing when CPTSD symptoms are happening so that you can take measures to come back into a regulated state before you try to communicate or solve anything. And I'll put more course links in the description section if you need help with that. It also helps to be very practical about your work life. What happens with complex trauma sometimes is that unmet needs from childhood 
leak into everything else. And we can go through our workday hurting that we didn't get enough acknowledgement or appreciation, things like that. And yeah, that can be a real thing. But for those of us who didn't get it as kids, the pain around it can get kind of oversized. So this is something to try to stay grounded about, to keep expectations right-sized. Now, one thing I didn't learn until pretty far into my career, and it made a bigger impact than anything else I'd learned up to that point, is that when you take a job, you're paid to make the organization and the other people who run it successful. And I did used to be somebody who didn't get that. I was worried more about what the job was giving me. So that's important, but it needed to be balanced with what I contributed. And I'm telling you, when this was explained to me by a mentor, not a work mentor, I never had a work mentor, honestly, but someone helped me see it, that shifting my focus like this made my career finally take off out of dumbed down work and on to a series of new opportunities that ultimately led me right here to be with you, trying to help you be successful. You can consider orienting yourself in a similar way towards the service of other people. Now that's not being a servant, that is bringing your gifts to bear. And I'm telling you, there is nothing more satisfying and fulfilling. It requires a lot of continuous learning, but you'll see how your old sense of disappointment and hurt sort of just gets swept away by a sense of self-worth and dignity when you're serving. Now, when you're bringing the best of yourself to work, not being a doormat, not being a Klingon who stays in bad situations, but bringing your best self, it gradually reveals even more of the goodness that's coded into you. You were meant for better things than a life that's limited by trauma. You're designed to heal and to grow and to bring good things into the world through everything you do, including your work, including the way you make money. In workplaces everywhere, people with complex PTSD are making tremendous contributions with their talents and hard work, and at the same time struggling with symptoms and living in fear that sooner or later, they're gonna get found out and passed over or penalized or fired. Has this happened to you? There are some patterns that are common to people who went through abuse and neglect as kids, and they can hold you back from getting hired in jobs that fit or from even seeking those jobs. And they can stop you from rising up to the level where you belong, doing what you really are capable of. Now, the bad news is that these patterns can get stuck. They can be hard to change. But the good news is that we do change them. And with some knowledge and support and perseverance, you can heal those tendencies and start using all your experiences, including some of the harsh ones, to become all that you were meant to be. And I can help you do that. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people to recognize and heal the symptoms that so often show up in adults who have PTSD from childhood. And today I wanna to read a letter from a student of mine named Sue, and she says, Hi Anna, I suffer from CPTSD and nobody at work knows. I spend an inordinate amount of time hiding the fact that my energy and flow is extremely inconsistent. I work at home and I manage to get my work done through self-flagellation more than anything else. That means being hard on herself. I feel as if my life is a lie because of the energy I put into hiding how I really am. I feel a strong urge to somehow come out as someone who finds it really difficult to finish tasks and do simple tasks. More sophisticated and large tasks are actually much easier for me. I think I could bear the humiliation of that but I can't risk losing my job because I have three teenagers and one extra for the last year to raise as a single mother. Ah, I'm on a decent salary and I wouldn't be able to find anything else on that salary, I don't think. I feel stuck in this situation, every day a stressful repeat of the day before, forcing myself to do simple tasks in a way that nobody else notices, but quietly wishing that people would notice so I can confess even if I lose everything as a consequence. Is there a way out? Thank you, Sue. Sue, yes, there's a way out and I'm here to help. I'm actually in awe of you for supporting you, your three kids and another kid while you're working as a single mom. And I hear you that your work is really a struggle right now. But before I start talking about some strategies to deal with work, I wanna just say with all my heart, that you are doing life's most important job, raising your kids. And if you were doing that under ideal circumstances, you'd have two adults helping with that, doing that job. You're doing both jobs. 
So just big hugs and support to you and validation. You made it this far. You're doing great. And I know because I spent many years in the same boat. But in my case, I just had two kids and their dad had them half the time. So it was much easier and it was still very hard. It's isolating and exhausting and thankless being a single parent, but this too shall pass. And I want to share some tips with you to stay strong and stay sane while you're still in this hard part of it. Okay. So first of all, I hear this urge in you to self-sabotage, to come out, as you say, as somebody who can't do your job where you actually crave to get found out that you're struggling, even if it means you lose your job, even if it means you can't support your family. Now, I'm so glad you haven't done that and that you did something really positive. Instead, you confessed to me. I'm safe. You told me how crazy the process is inside, where somehow you're getting the job done despite CPTSD symptoms. Now, when you talk to someone who understands, it can really help to get some perspective. So my question for you is, are your struggles with the small things on the job really as bad as you think? I'm guessing that what you mean is that you're disorganized, maybe dropping the ball on things and feeling ashamed about it. You're dysregulated. That's a brain thing that happens to people who had childhood trauma. It's hard to keep track of details, hard to hold memories in place. It feels like, you know, every time you try to remember something, it's like looking in your purse when you've just been stuffing things in there. It's not all neatly organized. It's okay. It can be reorganized. All right. I think it's interesting that the big picture things are easier for you. This is really valuable information. Actually, I can hear that you're tired and stressed and the conditions of your life are triggering a lot of dysregulation and fear. So it kind of makes sense that the small and detailed tasks are harder for your brain to manage. And it's absolutely kick ass that the big tasks are easier for you. You get those done. Now I'm going to suggest that you totally rotate this shame attack you're doing to yourself and just look at things for what they are. Small and simple tasks are not your strong point right now. Large and complex tasks are your strong point. So I just want to point out that often when someone has that combination, they are ideally teamed up with a detail person. Many, many great things have been accomplished in this world by teams that include big picture people and close up picture people. They're both really essential. The two really need each other. They're invaluable to the job and they work in complement with each other. Now in small companies or startups, people often have to play both roles. And I think it's interesting that at home you're doing the job of two parents and at work you're doing the job of two minds. So no wonder you're feeling the heat girl. That's four jobs. It never stops, right? You've got this though. You don't have to be perfect at all four jobs. I know that being a single parent means always feeling like you didn't do enough on one front or the other, you know, bad job, bad parent, bad job, bad parent, back and forth. That's what we do. All right. That's part of the deal. It's normal to feel that way. Now, the way you're doing both of those roles in your job right now at work, the big picture thinking, the little picture thinking, and I know there's other people you're working with who are handling both of those in one job. Well, that's awesome, but let's not envy them. Let's work toward you being that way too, or just kind of sliding along the continuum in that general direction of having less effort for you to handle both aspects of your job, or who knows, maybe one day getting to specialize in the big side and having somebody else fill in on the small side. That's an entirely possible scenario. Now I can definitely hear in your letter that you aren't comfortable feeling like you're not doing the job that you're paid to do. And I want you to build some confidence back in the work that you're doing, not fake, not give yourself a medal for whatever little thing you do confidence, but earned confidence, which comes when you get right with your own integrity and you feel pride in the work you're doing. And when you feel like, even if you do your job in a way that's tailored to your own neurology, you can go to bed each night knowing you did an honest day's work. That's a very good feeling. And we all miss the mark sometime, but it's worth making that your aim to put in an honest day's work and have that satisfaction. Okay. That's your pep talk. And I want you to keep this video handy so that every time your stress and trauma are making you fantasize about catastrophic failure so that you can stop dreading the future and just get the damage over with this positive perspective can help you stay solid and well organized and in present time back on track. If you ever want to leave your job, that's a choice, but let's help you get back in your strong place where 
what you do next is always a constructive choice or nearly always as best as you can a constructive choice choice is very powerful choice comes from healing your trauma all right strategy let's talk strategy the first one is i'm going to suggest that you totally embrace that your energy and workflow as you say are extremely inconsistent okay you are not alone in this work style lots of people who don't have cptsd are this way and those of us who do have CPTSD, a lot, a lot of us are this way. You, did you see my video a few weeks ago? It was, it was about crashing. You know, do you crash and lose productivity over it? It means working in big, bold bursts and then woo, drawing back into your cave for a rest. And if CPTSD is in the driver's seat, self-flagellation, like you said. But you don't have to attack yourself for having this work style. It's a style. It's how you roll, all right? And... A lot of workplaces are getting a lot more flexible about working. You know, they, they want your productivity. They will support you in doing it in the time and schedule that, that works. And I know that some jobs like, you know, you have to be there for other people at certain hours. Okay, fair enough. But I will say now that I'm self-employed, that's how I get to work and it works really well for me. I have a little plugin that lets me write an email in the middle of the night and then schedule it to send at seven in the morning when actually I'm sitting there groggy and doing my writing and meditating and kind of getting my brain ready for the day. That's how I actually operate. But I like my emails to go out then. And by the time I come out of meditation, I'm getting responses from people. I'm like ready to roll. All right. It's normal for us and for a lot of people. Now, Maybe this is causing problems for your employer, and if so, that could be a reason to talk to your employer and see about workarounds. Yes, that would be an opportunity to talk about having CPTSD, but honestly, so many of us have never actually been diagnosed. And even if we were, you have to kind of ask yourself, because CPTSD is not widely recognized, it's not always widely supported, would it lead to creating better circumstances on the job or could it possibly lead to being stigmatized or thought of as unreliable? And so, you know, I leave that to your judgment for how to handle that. What you may be seeking is flexibility, support, accommodation. Maybe you need a quiet space, um, things like that. You can ask for that without outing yourself as having some sort of a, you know, disorder. In general, I favor doing all you can to support yourself and find workarounds before you decide to ask for accommodations that may or may not be available to you. Then ask if you need to. All right, let's talk about the ability to focus. If you're like basically everyone on earth in this generation, focus is a challenge. Okay, here are some tools I use to support myself on that. One is noise canceling headphones. I'm serious, these are amazing. These are kind of expensive ones. You don't have to get them this fancy, but I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear you. And I can also play instrumental music. I personally, I can't listen to music with lyrics and get anything done. It totally hijacks my brain. I'm a very wordy person, but I can listen to white noise. I can listen to the sound of the wind and trees. I can listen to binaural beats. And some of these things can be quite calming. You can experiment with that. Number two, you can turn off notifications on this thing and on your computer. Turn off all notifications when you're doing focused work. And that goes very nicely with the third thing, which is using a timer and working in chunks of time. I like 25 minute chunks of time. Some people use 50 minute chunks of time. I take a five minute break. Some people take 10 minutes. So 25 minutes working, five minute break. 25 minutes working, five minute break. And I use a little Scrum application called Kanban Flow, K-A-N-B-A-N Flow, F-L-O-W. I love it. There's a lot of applications like it, but I can make columns of tasks. I can color code them for how much time they take. I can put names. I can slide them around to different columns. And when I want to time my work, I can go in and click a task, highlight it, a timer begins and it starts going for 25 minutes. All my notifications go off, headphones on, and I just do that. Then the timer goes off, I take a break, go get a cup of tea, check my email, whatever I wanna do, and then come back and do another one. So this technique is called the Pomodoro technique, by the way, you might've heard of it out there, Pomodoro, P-O-M-O-D-O-R-O. And the person who invented it, I think they had a little timer that looked like a tomato. Pomodoro is Italian for tomato, okay? <laughs> I love this technique. When I have writer's block, which is 
constantly. <laughs> I write a lot of stuff and I just, oh, I want to put it off. I just want to come up with some little, you know, do the laundry or do some dumb thing, go to the bank. And, but instead I set my Pomodoro, I make myself work for 25 minutes and usually I don't even need to do anything else. There's no more struggle anymore. I'm, I'm now, once I get started writing, I just, I don't even want to stop. It's just coming really easily. You can see if that works for you. There's a, fr it's a free app. I get the $5 a month version so that I have a little more, you know, features. I love it. Another thing is make big chunks of time where you block off categories of work. For me, I have people facing tasks, chunks of time, and then I have chunks of time where there are no people. No notifications, no email, no meetings. People time has to be like isolated off because if I have to do content creation, I just, I need like big stretches, five hours, eight hours of like no interruption or I, I'll stop. I'll stop and do emails at little intervals. I try never to browse during the day. It's so hard. Uh, part of my job involves the secret Facebook group for members. And the minute I go in there, you know, all the other stuff that's on Facebook starts catching my eye. And I try to be really disciplined about that. <laughs> it's <laughs> you're watching this on YouTube. Well, every time I post on YouTube, I'm seeing all this like cool stuff coming up for some of my heroes, you know, Richard Grannon and Russell Brand and all these great videos are coming up and I want to see what they're doing, but I got to get my work done first. So if I'm disciplined about anything, it's about protecting the chunks of time where I create and where I deal with people and consuming content. I only do like after nine o'clock at night. Okay. Next thing is keep a somewhat tidy space around you at work. I don't know about your dysregulation and PTSD, but when I see clutter, it tends to be dysregulating when my desk has everything kind of, you know, more or less put away kind of sort of perpendicular. I mean, I'm really not OCD about this. And in fact, because I, I work a lot and I have PTSD. I just generate mess everywhere I go. It's just like mess, mess, mess everywhere I go. But a couple times a day I stop and I tidy up my workspace because visually that chaos and stuff just sort of laying all over the place. It registers to me like a great big to do list, like screaming at me. And I just, I need everything to like be in a folder or turned face down. So it doesn't keep like calling my attention to it. I need to put my attention on one thing at a time, nice and slow. Now, finally, no fairy video would be complete without this. I'm recommending you use my daily practice techniques, writing and meditating, special techniques, morning and evening to calm and collect and clear up your mind. Now you might say, I don't have time for that. I can't put in a half an hour in the morning and a half an hour in the evening. And I totally understand that feeling, but trust me, these techniques will give back much more time than they consume because what is time? Time is the ability to pay attention and choose what you will do next. When you are throttled by stress, self attack, dysregulation, you have no time. You can't really read. You can't really get something done. You can't really have a conversation. So you, with your calm mind, it's like your time just opens way up. You get so much more done. So, that's my pep talk daily practice link down below in the description section. It's in this video and just every video I do have a look for it. So Sue, hang in there. You are not alone. And with some tools and self support, you can do this. Your life is important. And if trauma from the past is still affecting you and holding you back, it's so, so vital that you heal this, not just so that you can feel happier, even though it's very important that you're happy. It's important to heal because getting free of trauma may be the very thing you need to liberate your gifts. Your gifts are the unique abilities you have that the world needs. And if you've been feeling like no matter what you do, you keep feeling empty and your life is meaningless and the world has ripped you off and life is passing you by. I'm just going to say it. You might be locked out of your gifts. It could be that you're doing the wrong thing, or it could be that you're not seeing the possibilities right in front of you, but you know, on some level that you're meant to be doing something more than you are right now. Trauma really gets in the way of that, but the knowledge that you are meant for more, it lives in your mind, just like your gift lives in your being, in your potential, your gift is needed. And you may just be walking around having no idea what it is, or you may think you know what it is, but maybe you're wrong that can happen. And we got to look at this because 
I believe it's impossible to be truly fully happy until you're running on all six cylinders using everything you've got to yes, make a living of course, but also do something great for the benefit of others. I'm Anna Runkel, also known as the crappy childhood fairy. And today I'm going to read a letter from someone I'll call Jane, who's having a miserable time trying to make it as an artist. And she says, dear Anna, can you speak to the issues an artist faces? The nature of the work is so isolating and one can get thrown off easily if the work isn't going well. A lot of artists ask the question, why with overconsumption in the universe are artists living in basements? She says, I know my art lives a dead end life in a damp, dark space. Hmm. So few artists are ever shown and given opportunities. Making a living is a struggle and I'm tired of not being an equal to a white collar worker and forget Hollywood. I'm envious. There is a who knows who aspect to even get your work exhibited. It seems to me I was given this talent and not the one I asked for. And often I wish it had been given a different skill set. Maybe you can discuss how to see this differently. Thanks. Looking for equality and peace, Jane. All right. Thank you for that, Jane. Uh, this sounds, <laughs> this sounds like a really hard place. And this may come as a tough love message, but your working conditions, the way that you feel so unrewarded and so stuck are probably more limited by your own trauma and the pain that you carry than by the universe or how much people consume that you focused on or capitalism or anything else outside yourself. It's the inside job, owning what you want in your life and taking back your own power to create your life, to do what you want to do to leave things that you don't like. So you said that so few artists are ever shown and given opportunities. And yes, at a certain level, that's totally true. But actually you don't have to wait for galleries to show you show your work. I think if you choose to do art with the aim to get into like major galleries and be chosen and shown and funded, you're choosing this little tiny narrow path that is so easy to fail at. Because as you say, I, I, I believe you, it's a who knows who thing. It's, I don't even know like what people are buying at that level, that very expensive level. You're actually choosing to go into that. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like a discouraging parent here, but it's a, it's a self-hating choice. If what you really want is to be creative, to be using this talent that you have, to be enjoying it, to be making money off of it. Now, one thing I would say is when we're talking about gifts, they are a little different than talents. And I'm not really sure if what you're describing is a gift and because it makes you miserable and because it's not finding people, I'm just sort of wondering if it's more something you enjoy, but not your gift. And I'm, I don't mean to, you know, that's, that's like not a bad thing, actually. Like a person's gift could be healing. You know, they might be healing people in one aspect of their life and making a living selling insurance. And that's perfectly good because, you know, it's good to make a living and, um, some sort of, uh, healing work might be unpaid, or they might have a gift for healing and they've figured out a way to make a perfectly good living at it. You know, they could end up being a, a clinician of some kind. And so I want to point your attention to that, that, that the thing that you love has many forms of expression and the idea that it has to meet the approval and payment and, and, and like validation of all these structures out there in the world. That's, I, it's a self-hating choice. It's a, it's you, you've disempowered yourself from being in charge of your own fate right there. And, um, and like you said, you admitted you have this envy, you know, you know, envy is one of the seven deadly sins. It's a, it's a terrible thing. And it cuts you off from the light, you know, from, from that power that you need to actually create anything at all. So envy, envy just, it kills you. I know, you know, this intellectually, you don't want to be comparing yourself to other people. You want to be getting more and more true to yourself. So just to, just to go back over some of the first points I've made here is, is your gift is something that is going to start feeling good to you. And it's something that is going to land with people. It's going to, a gift is yours for the purpose of benefiting others. You have many aspects to yourself. You might have a separate profession. 
You might have hobbies. You know, I, I heal, but I also like to knit. I also like to raise frogs. <laughs> I really like TV. You know, you could have these talents. And I happen to be incredibly good at accounting. Actually, I'm not talking about myself. I'm not good at accounting, but I could be. And that doesn't mean it's my gift. It's, it could be a talent. I have a few talents. I have a pretty good singing voice, but I don't think singing is my gift. When I sing, basically nothing happens. When something happens for me is when I tell my story. I started doing that in like living room gatherings and I began to notice that people got became spellbound when I told my story and they started to say, oh, when you told me that story, I was so moved. So as I came to understand gifts, that's a sign. That's a sign. So with your art, Jane, when you do it, when you do it, whether people buy it or not, when you do your art, does it have an impact on people that in some way lifts them up, inspires them, makes things better for them or for the world? Does it do that? And again, this is not a judgment. I'm just, it's just a criteria to decide, is this a gift? So you self-described it as a talent and, but you were worried about having like saying, oh, I was given this talent and I didn't even want it and I wish it was something else. You know what? Ignore the talent. I, I'm really talented at making spreadsheets. I don't want to do it for a living. I don't want to do it for other people. The older I get, the less I have to make Excel spreadsheets. Wahoo, right? If you don't like using your talent that much, if it's making you that miserable, let it go. Let it go. You say you wish you had another another skill set. Well, I felt that way in 2008. <laughs> I had been working as a customer experience consultant. I enjoyed that work a lot, but when all my clients got laid off from their jobs, I didn't have any work. And there I had I actually owned a house. I had two kids. I was a divorced single mom. I had to come up with a way to make some money. And so I thought sometimes necessity is the mother of invention, right? <laughs> and I had to think really quick, like, how am I going to do this? How could I? I thought about how much money I needed, and it was way more than I made for per hour. And so I just thought it through. I did the math. What would I have to do to make the amount of money I need? And the thing that came to mind is that I used to know how to make videos. I used to study video production. I never really worked in it, but it was something I did as a hobby. And I made cold calls to 10 people I knew who worked in organizations that might hire somebody to make a video. And this was, this is 2008. It was really new to put videos on your website, but it could be done just, you know, like bandwidth was a big issue. YouTube is, had only been out like two, two years. And I said, Hey, I can make you a video to put on your website. And I think it would do amazing things to, you know, help educate your audience or sell whatever you're selling. I, I called just 10 people. I made, I, did, I made a decision. I'll call 10 people a day. I hate making cold calls, by the way. I hate making cold calls, <laughs> but I did it because I needed the money. <laughs> and um, I think that whole year I only made $11,000. I had to do something. And so so I, um, I got a podcast on how to make a cold call. I made some cold calls. I said, I'll do 10 a day. I did the research. I called 10 people. It was agony. You know, I just felt so stupid. Well, the next day, guess what? I had three video projects and one of them didn't pay anything. And one of them was a big drag. And one of them was a pretty decent video project with a university. And they ended up turning into a regular client. And then you know, I felt a little braver. And then I had, I actually had a video to put in my portfolio and I shared that with some more people that I knew who had jobs still. And then another one, I got another major client. And for like four or five years, I made videos for that organization. And I got to say, like, I had no idea what I was doing. Video had gone digital while I was not making video. And, um, so I found somebody who kind of knew how to shoot and edit kind of, and we made so many mistakes together. We didn't understand about formatting or color correction and there were sound problems. And I used to just be like freaking out the whole time, very high stress, but I learned. And then, um, the person who did the editing wasn't around and, um, and the deadline was there. I, I forget. I can't even remember what happened. So really fast, I had to learn to edit. And you know what I did? I Googled, how do I edit video? And I had the software, but it was daunting back then. It was, it was Final Cut 7. That's, that's what I bought. And it was really hard. I had never learned how to do it. So I knew somebody who knew it. She couldn't do the job, but I was just like, can you just show me really fast how to edit? And she showed me like five moves and then like all clunky on my laptop. I actually edited the video. I did it badly. I turned in the draft. I made the deadline. Later, the real editor came back. We, we saw it through. 
we got paid, you know, and I survived. I survived for another, you know, a few years later, actually, I was making pretty good money as a video producer. I had dozens of clients. I knew how to edit. I actually really, I like video editing, but I learned it by Googling it. And so long story for you, Jane, this is what I want to say. So my husband, he, he paints watercolors for pleasure. And um, he decided that he wanted to take it seriously. And he started paying a few hundred dollars a month to go to an online school for it. And this online school, it organizes some really good teachers and they each are in their home studios. You know, this is, this is when this is the time of social distancing. They're in home studios and they've mounted four cameras, one on the ceiling, some on the sides. They've mounted their cameras and they're showing what they're doing. And some of them are like super shy and they're, but they're good. They're all good painters. You know, they were chosen and they're teaching watercolor painting and the school, the online school has an arrangement where they get, I don't know, half the money or something, some really good part of the money. The school gets part of the money for organizing the whole thing and marketing it to people. And it ends up being this fabulous way that painters can make money and it ends up being a way that somebody like my husband can get really fine, high level training and painting without going to art school. Cause you know what that costs a few hundred dollars a month. And he gets to watch all these videos and he gets live training. And for a little extra, he can have a consultation with one of the painters who will, you can take a picture of your work and send it in. So I'm just trying to tell you, Jane, like your picture of being limited and the world being against you and there's no opportunities and it's so unfair. I'm just like, you know what, this is your fear. And I say that with the utmost love because as crappy childhood fairy, this is what I deal in. I help people see that they're having fear and resentment and to get free of it because you free Jane, you free, you get to make art and you get to invent ways that you can bring it to people and get money for it. And I I've never seen your art, but I'm going to believe you. It's probably quite good, right? But you're waiting for other people to give you permission to sell it. It's not working. Pivot time, pivot time, take control back of your art between the internet and, and the public's incredible shift toward online uh, online education. People like you and me have a huge opportunity to bring our art directly to people. I used to have to wait for permission from authorities and institutions too. I love this. Do you know crappy childhood fairy? I started it with an idea and a laptop. I was taping my videos on my laptop. Then my teenage son, he had a little camera and he would you go look at the early videos. They're, they're made by a teenager and it kind of shows <laughs> and he helped me make them. And it was this really positive experience for us. And I put them up on YouTube and many of you have heard the story. I put them on YouTube so that I could stream them into my blog. I thought my blog was going to be the thing. And I had, I don't know, you know, like 21 subscribers over there or something. <laughs> and one day I went over to YouTube to look at the videos and there were like, a thousand subscribers. It was crazy. I had no idea. Like I was way more popular on YouTube than I was on the blog where I was putting in all the effort. And so the lesson here is when you're seeking for what it is you do and how to do it and where is the opening for you to do your wonderful thing, you just start doing it. You take little steps at a time. Every day you take a little action towards the thing you're trying to do completely open-minded that you might be going in the wrong direction, but that your experience blundering into that direction is actually going to teach you something. So I, I learned how to edit video because the person I brought in to do it for me flaked out and went away one day. You know, that's, I learned by necessity and I learned how to, how to put videos on YouTube and make things that would be useful to you. I mean, you, you know about me because of YouTube, right? I didn't even set out to be a YouTuber, but there it is. It started happening. And whereas I thought my gift might be, I had a hunch that it was something to do with writing about complex PTSD and teaching people the techniques that I had learned. I thought that's where it would go. I started opening my mouth on YouTube. People started watching I, that benefit to other people started giving me energy to keep going and inspired me and directed me and gave me, gave me that push to try to do something more and better. And I would now say it's, it's actually the blog is fine. The blog is how some people like to consume the information. So cleaned up transcripts of my videos go there. Um, most weeks, <laughs> not even every week, but the videos is really where my gift comes alive and where I feel most like I'm connecting with people and being of service or trying to, it makes me so happy to actually be connected to people who can benefit from what I'm doing. And I think you need that Jane. 
I think that's why it's feeling like you're in this terrible basement. Part of it is you don't have money. Part of it is, part of it is because you're not connecting with people and serving them in the way that you need to. If, if, if this is your gift, you need to be, to be somehow lifting other people up with it. You know, gifts are sometimes things like, you know, they're sometimes very unsexy things like administration. Some people have a gift for that. And if we didn't have them, nothing would get done. Some people have a gift for hospitality. They're, they just find that people are all over their house all the time. You know, there's, that's, people just feel safe there or they feel, um, they, they feel like they can relax there. That's the gift of hospitality. So what you're looking for is the sign of where do people benefit? And I think that's a profound reorientation of your artwork rather than why haven't these people in a position to grant me visibility recognized me yet to how can I serve people and make their lives richer and happier somehow through my work. Because when you can do that, you're a lot more likely to be able to make money off your work as well. Okay. So I hope that helps you. That's my talk on gifts. <laughs> gifts are not always talents and it's not always how you make money, but it's really nice when there's some convergence there. And, um, I was able to leave my last job. I don't produce videos anymore. I just do this and it is my great joy to be doing this. And believe me, it paid nothing for a very long time. It really just cost a lot of money. And now I do make a living off of it. Yay. Huh? So thank you. Thank you to everybody in YouTube land for making that possible. And I want for all of you to find your gifts too, and to start having that harmony between what you really have to bring to the world and your happiness and how you, how you get on with your day, what you, how you fill your time, how you make your money and keep a roof over your head. I hope that comes together for you. Jane, don't forget to stay connected to people. Connection is so important. If I've learned one thing as crabby childhood fairy that I had previously overlooked, it's that everything that we do to heal only works when some connection is mixed into the weave there. There needs to be some connection as hard as it can be. If you took a poll and you had to name your five biggest triggers for trauma reactions, like feeling trapped, or humiliated or having an angry outburst. One of them, if you're like me, would be bad customer service. It's one thing when it's a restaurant or a retail shop where you have the option of never going there again, but when it's your mobile phone carrier or your gas and electric company or your bank or your health plan, where you're at the mercy of the other person to like not cut off your access to these things you need, if they then treat you in a way that's unfair or demeaning or in a way that humiliates you in front of other customers, that can be a huge trigger for complex PTSD symptoms. Have you ever really lost your cool in those situations, either as a customer or as the customer service worker? If one person tips over into emotional dysregulation or says something unkind, it's really common for the other person to get tipped over too. Both people will spend the next several hours in a dysregulated state and both people's families will likely find them stressed at the end of the day. And you can see how the, the ripple effect of one bad interaction can go on and on. But also if one of those people can turn around a bad interaction or prevent it or have a really positive customer service interaction, that also has a ripple effect on all the lives it touches. And that's what I want to talk about in this video. It's not just how bad customer service triggers CBTSD, but how good customer service can be a path of healing and even of joy. And I'm not exaggerating a path of healing old traumas and bringing happiness and joy, even when you're just busy buying groceries, or even when you're in jobs that are considered menial, it doesn't always happen, but there are things you can do to tip it in the right direction. You want to talk about this? Now, why do I know about this stuff? A little known fact is 15 or 20 years ago, I used to be a customer service consultant and I taught people how to transform customer service at the system level and at the level of one-to-one -one interactions. I loved this work. And before I ever made YouTube videos and before I even knew the word for CPTSD, I was teaching some of these same principles that I teach on this channel. I was intuitively noticing trauma in people and how it affected them. And I was teaching about staying focused on the positive outcome 
that you want in an interaction and about noticing and calming your triggers. And I'd get brought in to lead a half day workshop, usually with a clinic team or a phone support department. Usually it was a group of workers who had been getting a lot of complaints from customers. So talk about a tough crowd. I'd walk in and in almost every case, I'd face a group of people who, who were pissed off. They were feeling blamed, they were feeling tired, and they were just like daring me with their eyes to prove to them that I wasn't just one more useless trainer. And I'll tell you, I think a lot of my students back then were traumatized on the job from being immersed in bad interactions. They were often in systems that generated a lot of frustration and disappointment in customers. And the people working with those customers were bearing the brunt of that customer anger. They were getting blamed, but they didn't feel like they had the power to change anything. And for anyone who's ever had a job with conditions like that, you know it, it just sucks the life out of you. Your trauma goes up like a lot of the time. And when I'd start my workshop, I'd say most people felt like victims of their customers. And I could see how things got to that point. They weren't crazy, but they did have the power to make a lot of those interactions go differently, even so. And I knew I couldn't just start teaching it. it you know, I couldn't just begin and go to this room full of defensive, burned out people. They'd never listen to me. So I'd start by asking people if they'd had a bad customer service experience recently. <laughs> you know, basically everyone has. And I just invite anyone who wanted to, to tell us about it. And within 10 seconds, the first hand went up and then another hand and then another and another and another. Cause you know what? Everyone has been hurt as a customer before. And the stories came out and the emotions came out and people were laughing and then they were crying and they were talking about ways that bad customer service had hurt them and humiliated them and affected every part of their life, their health, their families, their kids, their, their self-confidence. And this was true not only when they were the customer in bad interactions, but when they were the worker who was maybe part of creating that bad interaction. It hurts both people, even when it's caused by just one of the people, the worker or the customer can cause it and both are affected. So then I'd ask them, have you had any good customer service experiences lately? And how did that affect you? And these amazing stories would come out of incredible kindness, generosity, lives being changed, one life actually being saved, you know, just like miracles. And then there'd be more laughter, more tears. And I'd ask them, when you're the person delivering customer service, if you could design all the days that you're going to be working in your life, would it be worth studying and practicing how you can deliver that good customer experience, not just for the customer, but for yourself? And everybody had this beautiful aha moment that customer service interactions are not this time like outside your life while you're just at work. This is a time it's, it's very much part of your life where you meet another human being and have the opportunity to help them feel seen and appreciated and cared for. And that is what everybody wants. And we give that to each other at the post office. We do it on the phone when we're, you know, trying to keep our bill from being shut off. We do it at the doctor's office. And yes, even with your mobile phone service provider, <laughs> even them. Now I'll be the first to acknowledge how hard it's been for me at times to stay regulated in customer service interactions. I have a history of trauma already and that can make me feel really triggered when I get treated like I'm dumb and when I'm trying to get a problem solved and they're mamming me, you know, say, ma'am, you're gonna have to really calm down. <laughs> well, then I, I really can't calm down. And by the way, if you think that you get dysregulated, you can take my dysregulation quiz. There is a link to it below in the description section. I have it under almost every video, but it's definitely under this one. Staying regulated is especially hard in customer service situations where things are going wrong, but you have no choice but to get through it because you need that product or service or solution and you just have to put up with any kind of bad treatment that they care to dish out. That is triggering. I'm talking about 
the person who puts you on hold for 45 minutes and then disconnects your call or the healthcare front desk worker who makes you say why you're visiting the doctor like right in front of 20 people in the waiting room or the government office that requires you to wait for four hours in a dirty room to even find out that you didn't bring the right paperwork and they're rude the manager right who comes out and tells you again ma'am calm down <laughs> you can tell i really don't like that one these experiences can feel demeaning they're infuriating they're unjust and they can tap into deep parts of your old trauma which is stuff you can't even connect to a specific experience necessarily in the past but now in the moment it's coming out like lava inside like an emotional flashback it's a feeling of overwhelm a feeling like you need to get out of there or you need to express that anger that's coming up inside you and you see sometimes as it's coming out you see in other people's faces how it's affecting them i don't know about you but that's like a feeling of shame where you know the feeling is really strong coming out these are cptsd reactions and yes they can be triggered by bad customer service and i know a lot of you are nodding your heads right now thinking about some doozies of bad customer service you've had happen to you and a lot of you are nodding too because you've been a service worker most of us have at one point or another or you are right now and you're going through this right now because it works both ways right part of what's happening in a bad customer service interaction is that the people working in these roles can feel just as threatened by the customer's power as the customer does by the worker's power. Now you may not feel like you have power as a customer, but the people who take jobs in customer service where because of factors they can't always control can also feel helpless in these situations. Well, in some organizations, these folks are encountering frustrated customers and getting yelled at all day. Have you ever had a job like that? And they also have a high probability of coming from a history of trauma. So to answer phones all day from angry customers, you'd almost have to have superpowers of dissociation that would allow you to just kind of like, you know, check out and tolerate that kind of interaction and getting hum hung up on, getting screamed at, or getting blamed or threatened that the customer is calling the manager and demanding that you be fired. <laughs> now, most customer service interactions are pretty good honestly we can be grateful for that but oh my gosh when it's bad it's so very bad and if you have cptsd a bad interaction can trigger dysregulation in you that lasts you know for hours or days sometimes like a, a a really bad interaction could cost me three days i wouldn't be able to work very well or focus you know it'd be it'd be almost like being sick and and that happening if you if you don't have any way to sort of change that or control it it can hold you back it can keep you down professionally and as a person and i'm torn apart when i see that so many people are carrying trauma and when one person's trauma gets set off it easily spreads to the other person and then another and another and you know we're more connected than we realize sometimes for better or for worse our nervous systems our hearts our emotions can be so tender so we protect ourselves we fight we put up a wall and that's why customer service interactions can be like this horrible mosh pit of aggression but they can also provide opportunities for extraordinary human kindness and connection it sometimes only takes one person could be the worker could be the customer to turn it around and it's worth being that person because why because even when you're on the phone with the gas company even when you're at work at a job that's not so great this is a day in your life and no matter how trivial the task at hand is there can be meaning in it because of the way that you're going to affect that other person who's there with you okay so you ready for some tips i'm going to start with five tips for workers and then i'll give you five tips for customers and it only takes one person remember sometimes to shift a negative interaction into a more positive interaction so for workers number one make a welcoming statement it's normally your role to acknowledge that a person has walked in the door or called you so instead of saying dr smith's office this is wanda what's your id number you can say Hello, thank you so much for holding. My name is Wanda and I'm the front desk coordinator here. May I ask your name? Ah, Joseph Jacobs. What is it I can help you with today? So 
Yes, that took a few seconds longer than the perfunctory greeting that the first thing was, but it puts the whole interaction on a more personal footing. And when people recognize they're talking to a fellow human, someone who could be their sister or their son or their mother or their friend, they're more likely to feel safe and to feel a responsibility to treat you with respect and kindness. All right, the second tip, and this isn't rocket science, but it's a simple step that you always want to follow. And that's to use friendly words and tone of voice. So if you go, hi, how can I help you? It sounds different than, hi, how can I help you? If you use friendly words and tone of voice every time, the whole interaction can go in a completely different direction than it might have gone. And that's what you want. Good, friendly, connected interactions that make workdays feel like real experiences that are part of your real life. The third tip is to demonstrate empathy. So if a customer says, hi, I'm calling because I'm supposed to have a nine o'clock appointment there today, but my car won't start and now I'm running late, you could say, okay, what time will you be here? But that's glossing over what the person just told you. So you can improve the interaction by acknowledging the problems that are mentioned and problems are often why a customer service call or visit gets initiated, right? So when your customer says their car won't start and they'll be late for their appointment, you can first demonstrate empathy and say something like, oh no, that must be so stressful. Okay, let's figure out what we can do to make sure you still get seen today. Do you have a sense yet of how soon you can get here? And that sounds better, right? So the fourth tip for workers is to put things in the positive. So if that caller says, well, I'm, I'm waiting for roadside assistance and they said they'd be here at 9.15 or so. I think maybe I'll be able to get there at 10 or so. Then your first reaction might be to say, 10? No, we won't have any appointments then. We're completely full. But even if you don't have any appointments, you can put things in the positive and say, hmm, it might be hard to fit you in at 10, but I'll tell you what we can do. If it works for you, we can reschedule you the day after tomorrow and then see how the answer was still no, but it was described in such a nice way, I'll tell you what we can do, right? So whereas a hard no can set off old feelings of people not caring or helping this person, putting things in the positive can help them feel like, ah, they have someone on their side, because they do. And finally, the fifth tip is to offer options. A big trigger for people with CPTSD is feeling trapped, needing something and counting on someone but not getting it and getting trapped without what they need. And these emotions and triggers aren't happening consciously. They're happening because of years and lifetimes of experience being powerless and trapped. So when your patient says, you know, uh, I can get there at 10, you can say, okay, we don't have any slots at 10, but we can reschedule you tomorrow. Or if you like, I can call you today if a slot opens up. It might not happen, but just in case it does, I can check and see if you'd be free to come in then. Now notice how the answer is still, you know, you'll have to reschedule. But now it's a choice how they'll do it. And that helps them know that they're respected, that they have a say in this, and that you care about them. Okay, now if you're a patient or customer in a customer service interaction, here are five tips that you can use to help make that interaction not just go positively, but turn out well so that you get what you need, your problem gets solved, and you get respected and cared for. All right, one, don't just begin with a question or complaint like, like, yes, I bought this flashlight here yesterday and it doesn't work. You can begin your interaction by making eye contact and smiling at the worker who's gonna be helping you and greet them. This is to help create a connection of two people that sort of sets the foundation for a better interaction. Then you can tell them why you're there. So number two is, just like I told the workers in their five tips, your second tip is to use friendly words and friendly tone of voice. This is like the magic tonic for things that happen between people. Friendliness is something we all need and it's more likely to elicit empathy and cooperation from the person who's working with you. Number three, is explain the problem or complaint or need that you have as clearly as you can without long stories, without blame, even if the broken flashlight created a problem for you. You don't have to go into what the whole problem was. You can just tell them, ah, it doesn't work. All right, because then number four is 
if needed, to demonstrate empathy. When a customer has a complaint or when a store is really busy or when there have been problems, it can be really stressful for the worker too. So especially if the worker is accustomed to getting complaints from people who you know, give them a hard time, um, start raising their voice, you don't want them to go to that emotional place. You want them to know that you're on their side, that you're working together. Because if their defenses come up, there's a risk that they'll doubt you or say something snarky to you or act cold and stony faced. And that's, that could end up triggering you. Then the hard feelings come up, <laughs> then they start ping ponging and then you say something and they say something and the whole thing can get very tense. So the solution is just stay kind and calm about the situation. Give the worker and the store the benefit of the doubt that they're acting in good faith. Let them know the resolution that you'd like. So in this case, let's say you want a replacement flashlight. And then that brings us to the fifth tip, which you might need if say they tell you they can't give you what you want. Let's say they've run out of flashlights and it's tempting in those moments to let them know, I'm so irritated, you know, I bought this, I you know, was counting on this, it's gonna be a big hassle to go get another one. Yeah, you wanna tell them you're inconvenienced, but I'm just telling you, there's no point in bringing that in. They know that, they don't have another one. So just remember, these interactions are part of your life. You want your life to be good. So the best thing that can happen is to get your refund and go somewhere else. And then treating people right here in this interaction with patience and kindness and goodwill. That's what you're gonna feel good about later. It's good to have those strengths with you, ready for anything. You've probably noticed that the customer service skills we're talking about are, are good for just about any situation in life. And it all has to do with noticing when you're dysregulated, getting regulated and staying regulated more of the time so that you can show that kindness and patience with people. If you have a history of trauma, I know you know how much it can come back and trigger thoughts and behaviors and limits that hurt your work life, that drag down your hopes of advancement in your career. Hardly anybody talks about this, and I don't know why. It's such an important part of life. Of course, the symptoms of childhood PTSD can hold you back at work. And I'm going to walk through some ways it does that and how you can turn it around, not just so that you have a fair chance at success and professional fulfillment in your life, and of course, financial security, hello, but because doing work that's meaningful to you, feeling some sense of accomplishment, some personal growth through your work, it's part of how to build a happy life. Now, at any level, work can be stabilizing. It can be a path to overcome the chaos of your childhood. It can be a way to overcome poverty. It's certainly been that for me. And work connects you to the world. And I know some jobs are horrible. I've had some of those too. I know what it's like to have to do work you hate just because you need the money to survive. But work gets us up in the morning. It draws us out into the world, into interactions with other people. It can be a second chance to learn how life works. And it can be a place where you come into your own, where you blossom. Now, even if you don't have that now, even if work is so triggering for you, you're just like, you know, locking yourself in, there is a path out. And I encourage you to set your sight on that path. Working is a large part of life, and even when work is menial, our engagement with it can be healing and uplifting. It can be a way to bring more good into the world, and that's really important too. So how do you do that? How can a person with a history of trauma rise up like that to become a person who finds joy on the job, who becomes an agent of goodness and of usefulness, who brings peace and comfort and order to environments that would otherwise be you know, hard-hearted or chaotic. Work is a way you can encourage other people and they need that. Work is one place where parts of who you really are can show up. And of course, work is a way, well, to get money. Let's talk about money. Money is how you have choices. Anyone who's ever been stuck and broke without work does not romanticize money. <laughs> of like, oh, money, it's just evil. It's like, no, money is choice. Money is survival and then money brings choices. Without money, you can be stuck in a terrible situation. You could be trapped in a bad relationship. So it's so important to learn how you can generate money through work so that always, no matter what's going on in your life, you're fulfilled and you have choices. All right, so what are some of the childhood PTSD symptoms 
that can show up at work and hold you back. Number one, you end up working for people in organizations that undramatized people would know not to work for. There are people who are abusive, dishonest, exploitative. It's not safe. And there is this tendency in people who grew up having to crap fit, to fit themselves to unacceptable situations at home, to be just too good at it. It's time to stop. Stop fitting yourself to bad things. Begin to get clear about what your standards are, about what is an appropriate, good, decent, workable situation where you can do your job. What kind of people do you need to work for? Get clear about this. This is one of, one of my symptoms of CPTSD is feeling like I just get sort of like buffeted around and end up in jobs like the only job that came along in the little that I was able to look for a job because I was really depressed or, you know, the, the first place that hired me. In my life, I've paid the price for not, for not exercising choice. And I've ended up in situations where I was really unhappy and I spent all my energy kind of pushing back against the thing I didn't like about the job rather than going, I don't like this job, I'll go somewhere else. And luckily, ever since I've been in the process of healing my trauma, you know, which is basically like 29 years now, I've been coming up and up and up. So things that fit me when I was younger, less experienced, but also still really underneath the weight of my trauma symptoms. Well, I'm in a different league now, and I've been in progressively better leagues all along where I could learn to, like I could do good customer service now that I don't have loss of control of my emotional you know, state just because I'm triggered. I have a way to, you know, compartmentalize that, put it aside, deliver the good customer service, and then go off and use my tools to deal with the dysregulation that happens. So you can really change your station in life by learning to work with your own symptoms. But for gosh sakes, do not get into work situations that are only going to make it worse. And don't kid yourself that just staying in a bad situation at work, that just staying there, well, okay, I know the thing that you should have, you know, you should keep your job until you've got another one lined up. I know that. But you have to weigh that against what happens to your spirit and your psyche when you sit there and take abuse. And what happens, and this is true in romantic relationships and just bad situations in general, you get eroded when you tolerate bad situations like that, bad treatment. It wears you down until, you know, you'd be at a job interview and you'd be like, hi, I know I'm not worth very much, but I thought I'd try. You know, you can't, you can't bring that energy and spirit that you need for the job interview. So staying in the job isn't everything. And I know money is always a consideration, but please take care of your spirit so that abuse doesn't wear you down to the point that you can't even try to take your step onward and out. Number two, you end up working for someone who is funnily very similar to your abusive parent and you fall into the same role that you once played in, in response to that person, whether that's people pleasing, overworking, rebelling against them, getting resentful or immobilized or suffering because you're not seen. That was my thing. You know, I wasn't really seen by, by my mom and I just kept getting bosses who would just completely overlook me. And no, they were not reading my mind or looking out for my best interest. And I later learned like what you have to do. You have to ask for the raise. You have to state what you feel that you would like to be doing and how much you should be paid for it. And then if they won't do it, you go somewhere else. I didn't do that for a long time because I was very insecure about whether I deserved more. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Sometimes though, not working for the type of person can help you not play your old role. So, you know, CPTSD symptoms are sticky like that. So that role, you know, the role where I become like the long suffering overlooked Cinderella that I had in my family of origin, you know, <laughs> they all get to go to the ball. I have to stay home and scrub the chimney or whatever. That was, it's a little bit of a metaphor for what it was like for me, but I kept playing that role in jobs. I like literally everybody went off to a, a conference once, a conference that I was really like probably the person who most should have been at it. And when they came back, they said, here, transcribe the recording. I remember that there was a moment of clarity. I'm like, I'm out of here. This is like, this is wrong. <laughs> but I had enough healing. I think that was maybe like three, four years into my healing when I was like, wait a minute, this isn't right. I actually am really good. It's a long story, but I wrote a book on the topic of the conference and nobody else had. And, uh, yeah, it was actually like a bad dynamic with the boss. The boss who had some sort of like, I don't know. I don't even know what. I don't even need to know. I think it was like competition or 
sexism, who knows? I just know I needed to not work there anymore and now I don't, so yay. <laughs> okay, this is number three. The person you work for is actually fine, but you parentify them anyway, waiting for them to realize how good you are um, and feeling jealous of the favor that they show to other people, waiting for them to give you better duties and a raise. You don't ever advocate for yourself and you end up resentful and not giving your best. So this is another version of like the abusive parent, but how about, you know, the boss is fine, but the old parent dynamic, you're coming up and projecting your half of it. Like, there's no way I'm going to be treated fairly. There's no way my needs are going to be met. They're against me. I can't, I can't. So when that's operating, that can really hold you back too. Like nobody has any idea that that's going on in your head, but they're soon going to notice the outward manifestations, you know, the way that you kind of resist and hunch up against, against growth and opportunities or questions or difficulty. And, and so, you know, I always want to remind people, it's, it, it makes sense sometimes to contain your feelings and to behave and to be appropriate even when your thoughts are inappropriate. <laughs> you know that you can't get away with expressing them. But the thing is, we all have a nervous system. So in a way, you can't really hide what's going on. People can feel it. And just for example, when somebody's like really angry and then you go, is something wrong? You seem angry and they go, no, I'm not angry. You know they are. If your nervous system works, you can feel it. I've heard theories that our nervous systems are like one giant organism, really, you know, and in a way that makes sense to me. That's how we have collective conscience, perhaps. That's how sometimes we have intuition about others. We actually have some form of connection that... Uh, may or may not be, you know, if, if it's physical, it's on some atomic level. I don't know what it is, but I just know I can't hide how I really feel. And so the healing has to happen for me to be perceived as not angry, as not terrified. You know, I have to honestly be who I present myself to be. That said, I, I totally believe that sometimes you fake it till you make it. Sometimes you act as if, sometimes you pretend you're brave and you start your first day of a new job, you know, even though it is frightening and there's a lot of doubts and all that. So sometimes we do that, but just remember people can sense it. Here's the thing. This is about parentifying your boss. Do not parentify your boss. They're not your parent. The other thing about parenting, parentifying your boss is it's a, it's, it's, it's a disordered dynamic right there because this is actually a contractual agreement. Now, a lot of times it becomes like family on a job, but it's a little different than a family in that they can fire you and that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's all they can fire you or they, it, it, there's so many things that can happen there that are not like a family. But a lot of times, because we have fuzzy boundaries, because our emotional needs weren't met in our families, then that, that sort of need for a family kind of goes in and weaves its tendrils into the whole job situation. And what happens is, if you're not treated fairly, if you're not invited to stay on another year, it can be devastating as if you've been cast out of your family which could have already happened in, in your actual family, right? So it's devastating for a person with those wounds from a family. So the way to head it off is to learn to have kinds of relationships and to be very clear with yourself through doing your homework, using your tools, having the support of a mentor. I really encourage you to do that. <laughs> tools and mentor, very potent combination. I can talk about that later in this video. But you want to do that so that you approach the job with actually a realistic dynamic, that you bring half of that dynamic in of like, this is a contractual arrangement. I, I have made an agreement with you that you will pay me if I do this job. And if I do this job well, that's one thing. And if I do this job badly, that's another thing. And if I would like things, if I would like to advance in this career, if I would like to get a raise, I really want to do the job well. I want to have a good relationship, but not one where I'm emotionally melting down, acting on like opening the portals of hell to those old childhood wounds and behaving as a rejected child. I was a rejected child and I have brought that energy to work and it doesn't make sense at work. And it's a very difficult position to put somebody in. And it's not something that tends to get you a raise or advancement. So you know, I, I can sort of, I can predict the comments from people who are feeling hurt by this and just feel like, but it's not fair. And I'm just going to say, yes, it is fair. A job is a contractual agreement. And if you've been at a job a long time, there are family like bonds there of loyalty. And, but, but in the end, in the end, a business has to look out for itself and sometimes at the expense of its people. That's how it works. And it's, 
hard, but it's how it is. And how it is is a very good thing to be able to see, recognize, and work with. So other bonds are more permanent. Other bonds have other obligations, other, you know, to stick with you through thick and thin, to love you even if you can't do your job. You know, that's a different bond. So there is so much, you know, my, my career was so liberated and set free. Like I was very stuck. Uh, I've often told people here, I couldn't get a job at McDonald's when I was 16. And I often got jobs because of my smarts. But a lot of because of the emotional energy I brought to jobs and um, that made me um, difficult, unreliable, kind of a handful at work. I didn't get along with some people too, a little too much of the time. I did not advance. They couldn't put me in charge of things. And so I often had this beautiful luxury of being able to create a job for myself, but it never involved moving up. And there was a real ceiling on how much money I could make. And that was not acceptable because for nine years, I was a single mom. I had to have enough money to get by. I had to do it. And so I did something different that when I learned this lesson and I left that job, I went and got this other job. And this was, a, I, I was very surprised. I got a 50% raise when I got a different job from the job that I had been, you know, very miserable and feeling stuck. Then later I went back to the old job and got another raise that was effectively double what I had made there in the past. And it was actually appropriate for my level and my education and for what I was contributing. The, where, the place that I was working, if, I were, if you were to ask me now, I wish I hadn't gone back there. Yes, I got money, but I was still working for the same people who didn't think I was worth it, who complained, you know, who <laughs> didn't give me opportunities. And there were so many ways that that job was like having a terrible boyfriend. You know, I used to say that it's kind of like having a boyfriend who won't commit and you've had children already and they still won't commit <laughs> and they won't help out and they won't, you know, that's what I, I just, it's like, well, that's interesting because that's what was going on in my real private private life. That's what was going on. And that's what happens. Unhealed trauma leads us into trauma-driven behaviors that are just going to keep playing out as that thing that is unhealed. So I didn't, I just, I had not healed that part of me that I, it's hard to define. Like, why would I do that? Why would I get into a relationship and have kids with a guy who wouldn't commit to me? Why would I do that? It was a lot like the, the, the dynamics in my home. You know, I didn't have that kind of like diehard commitment from my mom and the, my dad, my, my birth dad, who did feel that way about me died when I was a teenager. And so I don't know, I just kept crap fitting myself. That was one area that I could crap fit really well. And so I did. And I was very driven by a fear. Like I'm never going to have anything. I should just take what I can get job wise, partner wise. I should just take what I can get. And, um, it all worked out. I'm very happy now and my life is full and, and I have kids and, you know, it's, they're adult kids now. And so healing, you know, it's funny how our healed life can work with us wherever we come from. It can work with whatever wounds there are and life can unfold and be wonderful anyway. So don't worry. Don't worry if you've got problems right now. Don't worry if you're stuck in old patterns, but listen to me because I'm going to, I'm telling you a list of things at work that, are, that can really hold you down. And you can start changing those even if you don't have everything worked out in your life. All right, you ready for another one? Okay, this is kind of an extension of the last one. And this is where, you know, you've you sort of slipped into a family dynamic at your job and all of your energy is about trying to make them get it about you. Where you, what you can do with that energy is to take it and improve your skills and your knowledge and your options. And I can't stress this enough. Like evidently this is what normal parents teach their kids. <laughs> so I'm teaching you now, have, having gone through this cycle and, 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 you know, moved through and had these opportunities finally open up to me. But it came from, you know, I went and got a master's degree and I actually didn't use that master's degree. It was very fancy and I thought it was what I wanted. But when I worked there, that was the job I really didn't like and I wasn't really using it. And one thing led to another and I've ended up creating creating three different businesses for myself. And I recommend this. If you have CPTSD and family dynamics have a way of leaking into your workplace, I just found having my own business and having clients that I served was a lot more clean and straightforward and not like a parent. 
not like a family. I sign an agreement with somebody. I work for them for a couple of months. I, I, used to, I used to do customer service training as a consultant. Then I had a video production company. And now I do Crappy Childhood Fairy. And you're my client. And so when I, when I work directly with people like that and not through an employer doing something, it just really works for me. And it's motivating to me. And if it ever goes south, which sometimes it does, I've had some very icky clients before, well, you, then you just don't work with them again. It's so cool. So you have a lot more mobility to keep making, you know, if you're a person who's changing dramatically because you're healing your past trauma, doing consulting and changing clients often is a way that you can kind of keep upping your game and not waiting for somebody else to decide if they're going to give you, you know, a promotion. I, that's never worked for me. That's never worked for me. In my younger days, I was a comedian in Hollywood. And before that, I had been trying to make it in acting, right? And I never did. I feel like I could really act now, but, <laughs> but when I was doing that, I had to wait for somebody to think I was the right person. And they'd be like, mm, well, you have kind of a character face and da, 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 and you should get your nose fixed. They, you know, everything that I would ever have would be decided by somebody else. And I was like, you know what happens with comedians? They write their own ticket. <laughs> they, they write the role for themselves and anybody can get up on stage and do comedy. So these are just some examples of twists and turns in my career where I kept discovering where I could bring all my potential to bear. I think that my upbringing, I think that my trauma symptoms had really diminished and marked me as somebody not quite suitable for things that I actually was capable of. I had a lot of growth to do and I have set myself free. And honestly, crappy childhood fairy, everything I told you of the work that I've done before, it all came together into this job. So you never know if you keep working on yourself and your skills, by the way, that video production company, I had to teach myself to edit on Google. I Googled, how do you edit video? That's how I did it. And then I started charging money for it and I got people to pay me and eventually I hired a staff and, but I still, to this day, I do know how to edit video. I taught myself how to do it. So when people say, oh, I don't have an education, I'm like, okay, education is a thing. It's valuable, it's real. But if you need money right now, there are things you can teach yourself on this thing that we're on right now, which is the most powerful source of learning there has ever been in human history. There's quirks that I could complain about about YouTube, but it's all here. Like everything that you want to know how to do, it's here. And if you're motivated, you can teach yourself. So don't waste energy on some crappy boss who doesn't get you. Put your energy into learning things that you can either finally get recognized there or go somewhere where you are recognized. Like work is a joy. Work can be a wonderful way forward. I gave you a big speech about it at the beginning of this video about like, Money is important and it doesn't stop there. What's important is that connection to the world, that feeling of usefulness, the feeling of having somewhere you need to be every day because people are counting on you. These are the ingredients of happiness. I'm still talking about things that can hold you back and then what to do. So here's another one that can hold you back. And this, is a, this may not apply to you, but it sure applies to a lot of people who had trauma. You're in a line of work that's like loaded with traumatized people. All right, so I used to work in a nonprofit that was about a political thing that was very divisive, <laughs> very life and death, very intense. And one day I realized that about 80% of the people who worked there were adult children of alcoholics like me. And when adult children of alcoholics haven't healed, that's a really common symptom is being very excited by drama, conflict, drama, you know, playing the good guy and getting in there. And, you know, I'm glad there are good guys out there doing this stuff, but it was a really sick environment for me. And when I healed, I had to get out of that office because being around all that like trauma, drama energy and just like, oh my God, oh my God, you're not going to believe what Congress did today. I just, and I was just like, oh, bleh, I want to get out. And then I also, I used to like the show ER and I just, I just like didn't anymore. <laughs> I'm totally into shows that are high drama now. But when I was in my early recovery, I couldn't watch TV that was, it was all about adrenaline. And it was just so funny because they were acting out these like terrible scenarios where you're just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then in, you know, I was about a year into recovery where I realized this was stressing me out. It was draining me. And, I, and what I was really seeking through my recovery was to have less drama, more calm, more just like connection to things, more awareness. So trauma and fear as entertainment has its place, right? It's like horror movies and roller coasters. I've loved all of those things in due time. <laughs> and I used to think, you know how, you know how when rock and rollers get old and they're like 80 and they do songs about like, I like to sit on the porch.
it's a nice sunset and I used to think, oh God, I never want to be like that. Well, now I'm like that. <laughs> now I'm like that. I like songs that bring me peace and sort of help me appreciate life. <laughs> so we are where we are. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying about the professions though, <laughs> trauma-driven professions, um, uh, you know, emergency services person, you're, you're out there in the ambulance dealing with wrecks. A lot of people who are nurses, especially nurses in like a trauma unit or an ER, um, I don't need to tell you, very, very highly populated with people who grew up with trauma. And the fact is, most people find those jobs inhibiting to their ability to start changing their level of dysregulation. So that's a, that's a dilemma, right? You were drawn to it initially, and now it's starting to be an obstacle. But you know, if you change careers midway, you'd be like me and a lot of other people. It's okay to change careers, and a lot of times what you've done before is, is, is so helpful for educating people about some reality that you've worked in, you know personally about stuff. Like I, I did, I worked in public health for 30 years. I know a lot about that. I know how to talk to people who work in public health. I know the sensibility. I know the way funding works there and how that can drive the agenda. I know how to work outside of that while being respectful to it. So this is a skill too, is being somewhere and leaving it. And you can do that. All right, here's a, here's a characteristic that can get in the way of your career success. This one's kind of general. Trauma response, okay? Fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Fight, that's where you get very argumentative and high conflict. Um, flight, you escape, you run away, you drink, whatever. Fight, flight, freeze. Freeze is you just take crap. You don't do anything about it. Um, and fawn is you're like, oh, let me try to make you feel better. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're mad at me. Let me fix it. Okay, so those are four trauma responses. There may be others, right? Fix. Um, other things that start with F. <laughs> That's a trauma response, right? <laughs> I won't go there. But your trauma responses are too strong. So when work is stressful, which it can be, your trauma responses come off and it's just too strong. You know, you're too argumentative. You're too escapist. You know, you don't show up for work. You call in sick when the going gets tough. You freeze. You take all these, all this abuse and you don't change jobs or you fawn. You keep trying to make them like you and see you and get you. See how I'm talking about trauma, ex trauma responses through all of this? So that's kind of a general one. I probably should have said this in the introduction, but, but that's a, that's a thing that can get in your way. So trauma responses, they're natural. You want to kind of, we all have all of them at times and we tend to favor one or two of them. And you want to come back to center on that. So that instead of having a trauma response, you, when you feel hurt and upset by something, your, your trauma response happens. You have a way to separate, process that, heal it, calm it down, and then show up again at work. Not delivering them your trauma response, but your solution, whether that's to leave, defend yourself, um, advocate for yourself, you know, <laughs> quiet quit. Yeah, I, quiet quitting sounds terrible to me. What a, what a waste of life that is. If you're going to work, make the most of it. That's my philosophy. Okay. Number seven is you haven't learned to manage your trauma symptoms. So to hide them, you're keeping your life small. All right. So I talk about a lot about like playing small, right? So your trauma symptoms, when you, before you have any recovery, they mess up everything. They ruin your opportunities. They make you look foolish, sad, crazy. <laughs> you know, they, they thwart you from getting what you want. So one way you can control your trauma symptoms is by keeping your life small. Don't go for jobs that are challenging. Don't be around people. Be alone. Do something really unchallenging in isolation. Those are, I mean, that's what we do, right? I'm not really exaggerating. That's what we do. We're just doing jobs that are so easy or so repetitive that you can just do that. Now, I think, I think an easy, repetitive job can be very therapeutic when you're in a certain place, but it's not suitable for your whole life. It's not suitable. And just like isolating, sometimes you, got, you need some time alone, but isolating for your whole life is not a great idea. And yes, yes, I hear the chorus of people who say, no, it's great. Isolating's great. I really don't want to do it. But you're so busted because you watch my videos. So I know you're working on yourself and I'm teaching you about relational stuff. So even if you're a person who loves solitude, learning this relational stuff is powerful and good stuff and hang in there. There are, there are aspects of life. And if you don't believe me now, when you're old and you need some help to uh, take care of yourself or you're sick, you will see what I'm saying about the, how important it is to have people in your life. It's important. This is a big one. We could talk on and on and on about this. Number eight is emotional dysregulation. All right. 
this is probably the number one thing that gets in the way of of your advancement because emotional dysregulation rings you out. It can leave you with something very similar in your body to a hangover because you were crying all night or you were having a big argument the night before. And when you have drama in your private life, it can leak into your work life. So even if you keep it all together at work, like I, I think I was pretty good at that. I, I think I would lash out sometimes, but the drama I was having in my private life was showing up in my face and in the time I arrived at work and my bedraggled persona. Like I said, our nervous systems are, are connected. And so people could tell I was in great distress and they were kind and supportive of me, but they did not promote me. So I really, I really did work with mostly very kind people, but I couldn't get ahead and use my talents because I just could not keep out of the terrible problems that I was having on my own time. So emotional re-regulation, this is going to be your friend no matter what part of your life you're working on right now, your work, your relationships, your parenting, your neighbors, you know, all of it will require emotional re-regulation. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But what you really need, because, because all that dysregulation, it takes your productivity and you have these bursts of productivity and then it goes down. It's like a roller coaster, right? Productivity like a roller coaster. So sometimes you can get away with that and there's some types of work where bursts is sufficient that you can come in and just like deliver like crazy. Some people are very, very good at creating order out of a bunch of papers or processes and that's a gift too. So there are many gifts and you can never really be 100% certain that you have exactly this one, but your job is to start noticing where is that feedback that what you do benefits others. You get to do a lot of things just for yourself. You have a lot of talents and skills, but the gift is the thing that connects you to your greater purpose to be of service to this world in the best possible way. And you'll be clumsy with it and you won't have it right initially. Like you'll be on a path all your life to go towards what it is. Some people are very lucky and they find it early. It took me a long time. I'm living it right now and what I'm doing right now. And it just is so much happier. There's so much more abundant energy every day to do it because it just feels like what I'm made to do. And everybody is deserves to have that. Healing trauma is essential for you to discover that in yourself. So whatever you do for a living, and when, when I was first learning this, I saw a parking lot attendant. Um, they weren't even the attendant. They were the guy who sweeps the parking lot and just gets the fallen leaves out of it. And they were so kind and uplifting. And it was at a hospital. I, I had a long period where I was in and out of the hospital. And I would enjoy so much seeing this parking lot guy because he was kind and friendly to me. And he would sort of help me change my... I think he might have been a healer, actually. <laughs> I'd be going into the hospital for some dreadful thing. I'm, I'm fine now, but I'd be going in and he'd be like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and there was this funny way he sort of changed my whole attitude to like, I'm so grateful that I have healthcare to deal with this problem. My whole attitude would change. He wouldn't lecture me. He didn't say it. He just emanated it. And through working in a parking lot, which I'm sure was not the best paid job, uh, he exhibited joy and optimism that was transmissible. And I received that. I met a lot of really gifted people in it when I was in and out of the hospital. But if you've ever been in the hospital, they, they don't all have that. <laughs> it can be rough sometimes. Some people are just like mean. <laughs> They're mean and they don't care. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, there's a, it's a mixed bag out there, but my, my growth in healing is where I stopped focusing so much on how somebody was mean once to me in the hospital, or well, more than once, okay, and more on I admire these people so much. I want to be like that. I want to develop the things in myself where I'm that person for somebody else. And they start to have that experience of having their attitude lifted because of some incidental contact with me, even when I don't know I'm doing it. Like, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Narcissists have this devious way of sneaking up on you and injecting problems and self-doubt into your life. And it's almost like they put a spell on you. And people tell me this over and over again, that it can take a long time to finally realize that you are not causing all the pain and chaos that they're bringing into your life. That you're not a bad person or some kind of loser who's so bad that you can't even see how you're causing these problems. Because the truth is they are causing the problems. You're probably not the only person in their orbit who's hurting and attacking themselves. But when the day comes that you finally can see the truth, that this person is selfish and fickle and messing with you just to keep their ego afloat, 
and you set a boundary, well, look out. Because yes, while this will break the spell, temporarily at least, for you, the resulting abuse that narcissists tend to unload is going to be aimed at you. And this is when the temptation to fall back into subservience to them and into self-attack are going to kick in. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Sibel. And she writes, Dear Anna, I'm now struggling with a lot of anger and frustration because lately I understood with the help of my therapist and my good friend that one of my colleagues has been abusive to me for almost five years. My therapist suggested that this colleague may have borderline personality disorder. But the question is, how is it possible that I haven't noticed that there was something wrong with her and I let her abuse me verbally and emotionally for so many years? I've got this fairy pencil here. I'm going to circle things I want to come back to on a second reading, but let's read through just to see what Sibel is telling us. What's the story here? She says, I can understand that I was focused on surviving, but I was always letting her back into my life. It's so out of my character. I usually get rid of people who hurt me immediately. More likely that I would get rid of somebody too early rather than too late. And I lost so many good people this way. But she stuck with me and poisoned my life for half a decade. Wow. At first, she tried hard to be my friend. I was at her job interview, and she always told me I made such a good impression on her. I have to admit that she became the friend I needed at the time. I felt very lonely and wounded after being bullied in my previous workplace. What's more, we were both immigrants, so it felt like we had many things in common. Later, we started hanging out outside work and we shared some of our personal stories. We both grew up in dysfunctional homes. I had a narcissistic father and she was abandoned by her alcoholic mother. After this nice start, she was only criticizing me. She constantly told me that I was a negative and toxic person and that I needed to work on myself. And you know, it landed on the proper ground as I am always depressed. And she told me these things to quote, help me, so I would understand what I needed to change. I believed her because she was so optimistic and vibrant. Uh huh. I thought people liked her, but then she had these bad days. And when, when it was her bad day, it was everybody's bad day. I love that. That is, did you make that up? That is just brilliant. When it was her bad day, it was everybody's bad day. Sometimes when I came to work sleepy or just tired, she'd get mad at me because I brought negative energy. She claimed that she would feel my constant mood swings because she was so sensitive and affected by my negativity. She loved spirituality, personal growth, and quoting famous people, and she wanted good vibes only. Uh huh. I thought something was profoundly wrong with me, and she was the only generous person trying to help me. But I was never good enough and could never fulfill her expectations. Whenever I needed some distance from her, she would immediately stop talking to me and she started hanging out with somebody else to show me how popular she was. Then she would be passive aggressive or even openly aggressive. I'll never forget th this situation when we met at our colleague's dinner after many weeks of the silent treatment. She started asking people what their zodiac signs were. She could tell something nice about each sign, of course, but when it was my turn, she said, Gemini is the most two-faced, unstable zodiac sign, and nothing good can come out of it. She said it so viciously that I can't forget it. Then after a few days, she would start talking to me as if nothing had ever happened, and we were friends again. She was constantly afraid I was gossiping because I was taking a coffee break with somebody else. She said once, I don't know what you're talking about with that guy. And she was calling me a gossip girl because people liked me. She was talking negative stuff about anyone who was hanging out with me. When she asked me what this or that person said, I would say something like, oh, you know, he's having a bad time or she needed to talk. This would set her off. I felt like she was punishing me by keeping secrets. And I think it was revenge for the fact that I refused to tell her stuff about other people. So when I... Went back to college, she signed up for college too. When I mentioned that I would take time off at the end of August, guess what? In two hours, I would get a message from our boss that she took some time off at the end of August. I felt like I was in never-ending competition with her, even if I didn't know what this competition was about and what the rules were. On the one hand, she was thanking me for teaching her everything at work. On the other, it felt like she hated the fact that I was better at work. 
Every now and then, she would give me the silent treatment for no reason. For some reason, it would happen each September, plus some extra occasions across the year. The first years, I tried to do everything to regain her friendship. Then I changed my tactics, and I just let her be. But I felt that the tension was rising each day. At the end of this cycle, she'd take me to a small conference room at the office and pour all the crap on me. In the first years, I'd apologized and felt crap for a few days after. Only two years ago, I defended myself this one time. I said she was the gossiper and the manipulator, and everyone feels like walking on eggshells around her. And then I added something like, I don't care what you think about me. You don't need to hang out with me, and we don't need to talk ever again. I don't care. And then she started crying and apologizing and said she had a tough time. I forgave her. I felt sorry for her, so I even hugged her and said that everything would be all right, and she never took me to a conference room again. But the silent treatment was repeated a few more times. <sighs> all this time, I thought I deserved her unacceptable treatment. Six months ago, she was relocated overseas. I was happy and anxious, but still happy. <laughs> My other colleagues told me she sucked at work and nobody wanted to work with her apart from me. Nobody came to her goodbye party either. Maybe I'm crazy to think that, but coincidentally, she came to visit us last month. She stayed here a week. That was my last week in this company. I feel that it was her final attempt to get me because she heard I was leaving for good. Of course, there were some silly excuses for her to have a business trip, but frankly, it was nothing she couldn't do from overseas. And why I think she did it on purpose, because I believe she lived in some alternative reality. She applied different rules to her life. She was fighting imaginary fights with imaginary enemies. <laughs> there were no limits for her to take revenge, so I wouldn't be surprised if she convinced the managers that she needed to come back for that one week. I was her friend, so I knew her secrets too, but that was the moment when I took control, and I totally ignored her presence at the office. I was proud of myself. I regret so many things that happened between us. Why couldn't I just let her be? I lost my time and energy trying to fix the relationship with her. She took a lot of happiness from me. Now I'm losing my time ruminating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Also, now I see that I lost many valuable friendships at that workplace because I was so focused on her. I have many regrets now, and I don't know how to convince myself that I did the best I could, because I didn't. There were 120 other people at that office to hang out with, and I still focused on the most toxic person there. Is there a way to make sure that the next time I will focus on the right people? Next week, I'm starting in a new place. I don't want to end up with a crazy maker ever again. Thank you. Okay, Sibel, what a story. I'm so glad you're out. This is great. I have a feeling you're going to do very well. I have a feeling you're going to do very well that I hear a lot of healing in how you describe this, a lot of recognition. Um, I don't, you don't sound like somebody kind of stuck in this, in this story anymore, but I get it. It's hard to process. Like, why did I do this? So let's just, let's just break this down. Okay. You have, you have a therapist. Great. And your therapist thinks this is borderline personality disorder. And you know, I don't have a license to diagnose. Your therapist does. And so that, but that's sort of intriguing to me. I thought it sounded a little more like something else, like narcissism. It sounds pretty classic to me, but who knows? You know, who, <laughs> I'm always telling everybody like, you know, diagnosing people, whatever, because it doesn't really matter what you call it. What matters is how it affects you and what you're gonna do about it to change your life and stop being suppressed and oppressed by people who treat you like that. That is the thing. So I think we're all in agreement. Yeah, this, this was not good. Um, so you're just wondering like, how did it take you so long? So you said in here that you, well, first of all, you were both immigrants and also that you came from a dysfunctional family. You had a narcissistic father and that's the deal. You know, narcissist parent primes you to be able to tolerate narcissists in later life. That's the deal. It creates a certain kind of dynamic. Sometimes it's codependent. I think that's a little bit what you're describing here, but you're describing something more. And it's a, it's just a weird way that you were crap fitting to this, where she would accuse you, you, you would believe it. She would get her, you know, feeling of being good and accomplished by putting you down. And you guys kept going like that. You would just keep donating your energy and self-worth to her to the bottomless pit 
of her need, of her, <laughs> her demand for your supply, you know, <laughs> of, of self-esteem, of confidence, of knowledge. And um, she reminds me of some people I've encountered with the sort of like positive, you know, um, positive thinking, spirituality, all that stuff, the optimistic and vibrant thing. A lot of people call this toxic positivity. And I remember when I first heard that, I was like, how could positivity be toxic? You know, it's so helpful to be positive. Well, compared to what I had been through, it was positive, but I've totally encountered this. There's, you know, actually, you know, in some of the circles that I overlap with in the Venn diagram of what's on YouTube of like self-help, there's just like, you can do it. You just have to believe in yourself and all of this goes away. And, you know, I'm kind of, <laughs> sometimes I have people like help me with my YouTube channel or my content. And I'm always like, here's the thing about us, like bad stuff actually did happen and we have to be sensitive to that. And so that's always, it just always strikes me as, um, it has its good side, but it can have this just totally fake, manipulative, yes, narcissistic side to it. Um, and it, what I have noticed about it, you didn't say this about her, but what I've noticed about it is people who are into the toxic positivity, there's often um, kind of an addiction to cult-like figures and debting, you know, just because there's there's kind of that belief, like if you just spend more money on this, you're going to have more of it. So it kind of goes along as sort of a package with a lot of stuff that that seems pretty dysfunctional to me. But that said, it's not, you know, that's just baby with the bathwater. You know, there is uh, so much to be gained by, you know, learning from people who teach you how to like rethink things. I wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't been taught by, you know, certain figures and leaders who, who teach you how to like, you know, change how you see that. I used to feel quite defeated. I used to feel very limited by my trauma. So I get the attraction. And I was able to turn that around. A key moment for that was when I was um, participated in an exercise with a ton of people when I was deciding I was going to do crappy childhood fairy. And I, well, the one big fear holding me back is that people would be mean to me online. And I was in this exercise where we just, we just shouted out loud, people are going to give me hate mail. Yay. That means I'm in the game, you know, and it was this good moment. So, so there's good to that. And I can see why you're attracted and because you're kind of prone to depression. You didn't really talk about this, but I think that being an immigrant and um, being in a new place, I mean, you've obviously, you're, you, you have, you, I don't even know what you do for a living, but why do I get the feeling like you're, you got a lot going for you here. You got a lot going for you, but you would be a stranger in a strange land and trying to figure things out. And of course, like good for you for just pursuing things that were positive, optimistic, forward thinking. But with the narcissist dad, yeah, you know, the person you picked had this downside, this very, very downside of them where she flipped on you. And I think that's where your therapist thought uh, borderline flipped on you, where it's all about, hey, you know, believe in this great thing and then takes out all this crap on you. You know, ideal. I don't know if she idealized you. She idealized somebody, you know, out there. But then she devalues you, this total devaluation where she tears you apart in the conference room. And you felt like you deserved it. And that's what you were primed to do as a kid. So not your fault, not your fault. You keep asking like, how could I do that? But you have this really nicely developed, like I've got it together. Why am I letting this happen? It's like, cause your childhood trauma is haunting you a little bit. It happens to everybody. And your awareness is very sharp right now. You feel it, you see it, you're doing something about it. You are gonna be okay. You are gonna get through this. You're on a good path. So every time you tried to get some distance from her, she'd immediately stop talking to you. So there's like the manipulative trauma bond behavior, you know, I shun you, I won't talk to you, I gossip about you. And then the nasty astrological thing, I could just picture that, that should be in a movie. <laughs> it's almost like a comedy, you know, of just a horrible person just sitting there going, but your astrological sign is just S-H-I-T, you know. <laughs> It's funny from the outside, but I imagine it was hard at the time and you were in front of people. But you know what? I bet they saw it too. Well, they did. Nobody went to her going away party. That is so telling. She called you names and she would talk crap about anybody you hung out with. And then she would be angry at you because you wouldn't disclose private conversations that you had with people. That sounds really familiar to me where that she kind of sees you as an extension of herself and you as no right to have things that are private between you and other friends, right? 
Uh, that totally rings a bell. You know, what you're describing also is, it's like one of the sets of colors that people show when they were traumatized as kids. And you said, didn't she have an alcoholic mom? So, you know, that does a number on people. And alcoholic moms are very neglectful. And um, as somebody who had an alcoholic mom, I can just say that sometimes, you know, there's this phase of development where you blow your own horn because nobody ever did. And you just feel like you have to prove to everybody, look, I'm somebody, I'm great, you know, and it's a real turnoff to everybody. And if a person has some sensitivity, they notice that and can start growing out of that behavior and into something where they feel authentically good about themselves and can sort of relax and be themselves. She doesn't sound like she's in that place right now. So, but luckily she's in another country and you don't have to deal with this anymore. All right, so here's where I think it started to really get to you. Um, you went back to college, so she went to college too. You took a vacation in August, she took a vacation in August. You felt like it was a competition, but you didn't even know what the competition was about. I don't know, maybe. I know that people like that do that, but also like August is the most common time for, for vacations and going to college is something that young people do, so who knows. Um, and she thanked you for what you taught. She hated that you were better. There's a movie kind of about that loosely, you know, a little bit related called All About Eve that you might want to check out sometime <laughs> about a protege who comes and just sort of destroys the person who taught her. So she took you into the conference room two years ago and you defended yourself. Woo, I just love this scene where you did that. She tried to pour it out and then you just gave it to her. You were like, everyone walks on eggshells. You're a gossiper, you're a manipulator. You know, I don't care what you think about me. That's like the worst thing you can say to a narcissist. I don't even care what you think about me, right? I don't care. You don't wanna hang out with me? Fine, we don't have to talk. <laughs> then she started crying and apologizing and was, was it sincere? Who knows? I think people in the comments will take votes on that. But as, if she's a traumatized person, you know, when everybody abandons ship on her, then it is pretty frightening. But still, she's no friend of yours, is she? So she started again with the silent treatment. I am not a fan of the silent treatment. I just did a video about it. The silent treatment is manipulative and cruel and not acceptable in a relationship that anybody in intends to continue and, you know, cherish. It's just not acceptable. Um, so you thought you deserved it, but six months ago she went away. I don't think you thought you deserved it. I think that you started to rise above this when you stood up to her. So you're doing, I think you're stronger than you know. Um, but yeah, she, she had different rules for her life. She was fighting imaginary fights with imaginary enemies. Mm, bullet points from Wikipedia narcissist, right? There were no limits for her to take revenge. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be surprised if she convinced, you know, so she came back just to get you. So this is where maybe she did. I don't know. She had no other friends, right? Who knows what she was up to? But you know what? Your, your attitude of like, I don't even care. That is the correct one. Her actions have no meaning anymore to you. They just have no meaning. It doesn't matter because she's fighting an imaginary battle. If it's with you or somebody else, who even knows? And now you've moved on to a new job. So the question is, how can you stop going for the toxic people and hold your space for the good people? And the way you do that is by what you're doing right now. You're opening up the story for input. You have a therapist. You're sharing it here on YouTube with like thousands of people. Thousands of people will watch this. Many will weigh in and talk to you about it. But to face honestly, what were the red flags that you saw? What were the conditions that made you vulnerable? I heard you say you were lonely. It was kind of what you needed. You know what I've noticed is that when we're the most lost is when we're the most vulnerable to sort of narcissistic abuse because what we sometimes gravitate towards and sometimes in a positive and well, it works out well way is to strong leader people. People who are like, this is what we're gonna do. This is your program, sort of like the army or getting into 12-step um, recovery or something with a strong sponsor. It's like somebody lays out the plan and you just do what you're told. And that can be very helpful. And then the second phase of development that comes after that is where you begin to individuate again. There's actually a movie I love that's about that progression where you get told what to do and then you individuate again. And it's called The Master. A fantastic movie out there. Okay. So I wish you luck. Sabelle, I think you're on a good path. I answer a lot of letters and sometimes I'm sort of imploring people. It's like, really take seriously, watch out for yourself. I think you're in a good spot. 
um, I encourage you, I don't know if you're like geographically moving or anything. So I, I encourage you to have a community around you of people who know what it is you're working on. Maybe people who have similar kinds of backgrounds that they're trying to resolve. You'd certainly always be welcome in our community and our membership at Crappy Childhood Ferry. We have you know, a whole bunch of people who support each other here and use the tools here to get better. But it's so important as you use the tools that you choose that you have companionship with people so that you're not always just kind of off all by yourself, kind of losing the thread if somebody is manipulating you. I, I think it's realistic to expect that at least for some time in your life, you're going to have a vulnerability to people like that. You'll have a little bit of a blind spot. You know, I have that with like drug addicts. You might have it with narcissists. So it's just to kind of respect that, to just go, sometimes I need guardrails, I need people, I need support to help me spot that when it's looking me in the face. This topic is huge. How do you work and have a career and actually advance in your career even though you have PTSD symptoms from childhood? Past trauma can really block your ability to handle yourself and take the necessary actions that anyone needs to take if they're going to pursue a professional dream that involves staying productive and working with other people, which frankly can be hard for us. Because just about all jobs and all professional accomplishments involve that productivity and connecting with people. So here are some major areas that I recommend you work on healing so that you can enjoy and advance in your career. All right. Number one, you'll need to heal the tendency to wear the harshness of your past or of the present, like on your sleeve. Do you know that saying, like you just show it to the world? So you wouldn't want to be talking about the past all the time. You wouldn't want to be using it as your identity or bragging about it. Like it was so bad for me, everybody. I know very well how this can be a problem because I grew up like welfare poor and I had parents who were incredibly brilliant. My mom, my dad, my stepdad, the problems in the family, mostly stemming from alcoholism, actually, in some of the members, it absolutely crushed my parents' lives. They were all highly educated, but they were frustrated. We were poor most of the time, and there was a world of trouble and grief because of their struggle. And that's the background where I grew up. And like so many of you, I was determined that I would never be like them. I would be different. And in some ways I was. I didn't become an alcoholic, probably through no great virtue, but because of luck of the genetic draw. I was a great student. I was intelligent, but mostly, I didn't have any supervision from parents, so when it was time to go to college, I had no idea how to go there. I walked into the admissions office at the University of Arizona in August of the year after I got out of high school, and I found out for the first time that you were supposed to apply and that you needed to take the SAT test. So that first semester, I went to community college and I cleaned houses to support myself. In the spring semester, I got into the U of A, but I had no idea how the whole thing worked or how I was supposed to support myself. And, you know, and eventually I figured it out. I became a good student. And if that's all it took to have a good career, I would have been fine. But my problems went way beyond education. I had terrible self-esteem and I had trouble dealing with people. I was always in conflicts. Well, not always, but often in conflicts. And I'd make some new best friends and then the friendships would blow up. And this happened in my romantic life too, which really damaged the energy that I brought to work. And so these are some of the ways that people with trauma can wear their past on their sleeve. It, it, it just comes with you into the job. Another way that you could be wearing it on your sleeve, not that you mean to, but maybe you dress too shabbily. Maybe that you're, the way you dress reflects low self-esteem or poverty consciousness. And it's not your fault that you grew up poor and most people in the world are poor, but if you're trying to move up in the world, you know, the it's just really good advice that you would want to dress the part. And so putting energy into that, maybe you didn't learn it at home, but it's a good thing to do now. Another thing in this, in that category of wearing your trauma on your sleeve is, uh, it's time to become mindful about how much you disclose to people about yourself, not just about your past and the trauma and, you know, oh, I was abused. You don't necessarily want to bring that out very early in a friendship with somebody. 
but also self-disclosing about, um, you know, what's going on at home right now or how much traffic there was or how sick you are or what the symptoms were. Because I wasn't very consciously parented, my parents knew how to act with people, I think, but I was sort of feral and I didn't know. And I would often go to work and I would just be talking about problems and how much I resented people in the office. And I was just, you know, I was just, I was sort of an open book, but not in a good way. And it stigmatized me. So another thing would be, you kind of almost brag about how bad things used to be in the past, just so that people will think that you're interesting or worthy, right? There's, there's an element in our culture where we sort of, we make victims into heroes only because they were victims. And it is heroic. It's a big deal to come up from a difficult past and to be working in a job. But it's appropriate to measure out how much you say about what that past is and not try to wear it like a badge of honor. Um, all by itself. You know, you still, just like everybody there, you kind of have to prove yourself. You have to learn skills. You have to get along with people and you have to get things done. That's kind of what jobs generally expect, right? All right. So the second big area, a big trauma symptom area that you're going to need to heal to succeed at work is to deal with a, the tendency to underfunction. Now, some of us are overfunctioners and some are underfunctioners. And, and, and I'll tell you what exactly that is in a minute, but People who overfunction, who do too much, who like stay too late, work, burn the midnight oil, burn themselves out, get really mad later that nobody reciprocated how much they're putting into a job or a relationship or something. With overfunctioning, there's often the big productivity crash that comes along and you know, you can't you can't stay with it. So you set this expectation, hey, I can do everything, I'm heroic, and and then you can't. Underfunctioning is sometimes the consequence of overfunctioning for a period of time, or for some people, it's just like their basic speed. So underfunctioning includes things like having a really hard time focusing for a long period of time, you know, being restless at work, um, jumping on the internet, just can't really, uh, you know, can't really focus enough, being unreliable, not showing up on time for things where people were counting on you, or even worse, lying about the fact that you did it or make, you know, making up a fake story about why you didn't show up on time or not even admitting that you, <laughs> there's like lying. And then there's pretending that it's not a problem. You know, if you didn't show up for something where people were counting on you personally, that's my pet peeve. I don't like it when people lie or don't admit like it's, if they just say I made a mistake, <laughs> I'm like, all right, I make mistakes. I get it. But if they're just like, yeah, but it was because of, you know, traffic or something. And I'm like, I drove here too. I know it's not traffic or they just don't even acknowledge. Sorry, I'm late. Here's a little trick, by the way. When you come into a business meeting and you did have to be late, instead of coming in, this is, it's very disruptive for the meeting. When you come in late to a meeting and people are already working, a person whose trauma is just hanging all over them comes in and goes, Hey, I'm here. Oh my God, the traffic. Oh, I was trying to get here. And I thought, Oh, and I was going to call, but I couldn't call. And uh, that energy is really disruptive and calls a lot of attention to the fact that you're late. Here's what you can do when you're late. You come in very quietly, just don't let the door bang, you know, be quiet and come in and say, sorry, I'm late and sit down, get out something to write on and start paying attention. You need not explain. If somebody asks you, maybe you can explain. Personally, I recommend experimenting with telling the truth about things. It holds you accountable for what's going on and allows you to make some positive changes in your life. All right, the third big symptom area of childhood PTSD that needs to be healed for you to succeed at work is a tendency to feel overwhelmed, like so overwhelmed that you can't even begin. You can't begin the work. Now I get this. I get very overwhelmed. That's a PTSD thing I have. And I have a whole system. I have a morning routine that helps me start the day with a one foot in front of the other approach rather than just a big, oh, the day, the day. I wake up like that. It's like an emotional flashback. My emotional flashbacks, that's a trauma thing. They're like this. I wake up and I'm like, it's been going on like in my dreams at night. I have dysregulation dreams even. And so I wake up sometimes in all this distress. It's like, oh, I have so much to do. I have so much to do. And why is it me? Why is it me? I have to do everything. So that's an emotional flashback. When I start thinking that, if I don't stop it and start using my tools to come back and go, I don't have to do everything. I only have to do it one thing at a time. I can only do them, uh, you know, in a certain order. 
I'm going to make a list of what that order is and the best I can and start tackling it. To do that, I start with my morning routine, which always begins, I go get something to drink and I do my daily practice. And that's a specific writing technique followed by a specific meditation technique. Very simple, shockingly effective to help move that emotional flashbacky mind, those distressed hamster wheel thoughts of like, oh my God, I gotta do so much, I gotta do so much. That's, how, that's the shape that my complex PTSD takes. And untreated, it just turns me into a nervous wreck who's angry, who's ineffective, who's isolated because those the angry and angry part is very offensive to other people. So instead, I make room in my mind for inspiration, creativity, ideas, and action by using these techniques. And if you ever want to learn those, they're always below all my videos, the daily practice. It's a free course. I think something like half a million people have taken it now. And that makes me so happy because it's really helpful. And the only way to find out if it helps you is to try it. So the overwhelm um, begins with, I get my mind in order with the racing thoughts and get the fearful and resentful thoughts out of my mind and onto paper. When I'm done with my daily practice, I take a shower, I go get my breakfast, and then I sit down and I work my to-do list. And I use an online tool for that. Lots of people have different ones. I use this thing called Kanban Flow, K-A-N-B-A-N Flow. It's, um, it's a free app, about, although I have a paid version, it's $5 a month or something. And it's a little structure where I can click and drag tasks into columns and I color code them and I plan each day <laughs> what I'm gonna do. And I always put way too much in and then at the end of the day, I can move them over into the next day or sort of rearrange the tasks ahead of me. And I love this tool. It's got a little timer built in and I can, it'll say, I click the timer, it says click on a task and I go, oh, I'm gonna, you know, prep the intros to five videos or something. So I put that and I time that like five videos, that's like an hour and a half for me, right? If I, if I already know what the letters are, I've picked the letters, but I'm gonna prepare the introductions and sort of think through and what's the, what's the download I'm gonna recommend at the end. I put some thought into that. Okay, hour and a half, hour and a half for me is this like green color. <laughs> half an hour is yellow <laughs> and two hours is blue. So I have the whole color system of how long something takes and then I can sort of see my day. But I click on the task I'm gonna do and then I start a timer and I've got my timer set at 25 minutes. It's called the Pomodoro method. Pomodoro is the Italian word for tomato and legend has it, the person who invented this technique um, was using a timer shaped like a tomato, Pomodoro. <laughs> and, and I do that 25 minutes. So uh, like sometimes I try to freelance it and just get productive all by myself without a timer. And sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm not. I get very, you know, I work on a computer and also on my computer is this very interesting thing called the internet. And it's hard to resist going in there and go, oh, what's happening on YouTube today? How's the stats there? What are the comments and Twitter and, and you know, Facebook? Oh, somebody wants something. And next thing you know, I can't even remember what I intended to work on, literally. And you probably have the same thing. Like, I'm not being shocking here. I have that. I don't have ADHD. I'm very capable of focusing but I need tools. And so setting a timer, it goes off after 25 minutes and I shut down tabs. I shut down notifications for that period of time. And I just do that thing for 25 minutes. And it's, in, it's really powerful if I can get started with a set of tasks that way. Being able to get things done is my superpower. I, I have so many like CPTSD traits that make it hard, but the reason I've been able to make a living in my life mostly, and certainly for the past 23 years, as a self-employed person, it's because I'm really good. I, I can see what needs to be done and I can do it. And I used to do it for clients and now I do it for Crappy Childhood Fairy. And I just have this very honed ability to go in and go, let's see, where are we? Where are we trying to get? What do we need to do? I have a, a big picture view of things. I'm good at that, analytical thinking. And people have different strengths and that's that one's one of mine. So I can see what to do. And I used to be very helpful to my um, consulting clients because I'd look at a project and then I would think through, here's where we need to be, here's what you need to do. And I would send them an email with this beautiful list of questions and action items. And that's like my dream is that I have somebody like me who helps me do that now that I'm always like, you know, out there leading crappy childhood fairy. So 
staying organized. It's not, it's not natural to me because of my trauma and I'm very good at it because of my ability to use tools. That's what I'm trying to get at. So that's overwhelm as something that keeps a person in under functioning. Another one is a tendency to favor doing grunt work, work for which you're gravely overqualified rather than going for more challenging or higher paid roles because you get so triggered that your CPTSD symptoms come out that trying to stick your neck out or try something hard for you is too much. You can learn to bring that back down, but that's a sign that you're under functioning. If you're doing work where you're like, people don't even have any idea, like I don't belong here, but we put ourselves there. We will often perceive ourselves as having no choice, but I'm, ge I'm making this video to try to talk to that part of you that knows that deep down inside there is a choice and it might take some preparation and some courage and some work on healing your CPTSD symptoms so you can do it. But with more healing, you can take greater risks and put yourself out there and do the sort of job that you really can do, the, the one that gives you joy and that pays adequately. I want that for everybody. All right, another way that we underfunction is not asking for what we want. Do you do that? Where instead of saying, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to have a promotion or I want to stop working in this part of the company and I want to work in that one or I don't want to deal with this unpleasant person anymore and we just think oh I have to put up with this I can't you know make a fuss because again I can't deal with how triggered I get around it you might not even be consciously having that thought but if you can't manage your CPTSD triggers and you get dysregulated and upset about things that set off your nervous system into CPTSD symptoms you have to make your life small Everything depends on learning to calm your triggers, not trying to make everybody else not trigger you. You can never really make that happen, but learning to calm your response to triggers until they're barely even triggers anymore. And then your life starts getting a lot bigger. That's under functioning. The thing about over functioning, the opposite is like doing things for other people that they can do for themselves, trying to do more than your share, trying to prove yourself to the boss by like, look, I did 27 things for you instead of the one thing you asked. The problem with that is that if it's not rewarded, which it usually wouldn't be if it's not asked for, maybe, I don't know, but if it's not rewarded, it goes into resentment. The overfunctioning isn't like a genuine expression of yourself. It's a strategy to dance around and try to get somebody to like you and think you're good enough. So that's also like a CPTSD symptom to do that. We don't want to either overfunction or underfunction. There's a time for each, like in vacation, maybe you underfunction. When there's a big deadline, you overfunction, but you don't want to be a person who's stuck in one gear or the other. All right. The third area of CPTSD symptoms that can really get in the way of your career growth is getting dysregulated on the job. Now you can learn to re-regulate and it will make all the difference. And I can just like that has been my experience and it was very quick that I began to change when I learned to identify that I was dysregulated and I used my tools to re-regulate. And again, that's the daily practice course I teach. It's down in the description section. I recommend that you take this need to master re-regulation very seriously. If you get dysregulated, and by dysregulated, I mean a nervous system reaction to stress that people with trauma often get, which leads you to feel discombobulated, numb, emotionally kind of on a roller coaster, like your anger is too much or your sadness is too much or you're too excited about something. It's emotional dysregulation. If you get sick a lot, a lot of chronic diseases with no origin, that could be dysregulation. Inability to focus or learn, uh, inability to read the room, like you walk in and you can't really tell what's going on with people. All of that can be dysregulation and dysregulation has now turned out to be the core symptom that drives so many other trauma symptoms. So if you get dysregulated, you have everything to gain by learning to re-regulate and mastering it on the job and outside of the job. Dysregulation is the reason why you may be getting those productivity crashes where you get some sort of accomplishment, you put yourself out there, you get some accolades or and then, you know, somebody says one little critical word and zoom, you go back down dysregulated people are really capable of accomplishing things, but they have a harder time sustaining just kind of a steady progress. There's these crashes of productivity. And if you have those, you may have been trying to hide them on the job, pretending you're sick, not really knowing what's wrong. Before I had healing for my complex PTSD, 
I would say when something really good happened or I got recognized for something, a promotion, or you know, in my personal life, like somebody I really liked asked me out, something like that, I could have a productivity crash for three days easily. And to this day, if I get really, really upset about something, I can have another productivity crash. If I get dysregulated badly, I, it takes a certain amount of time to recover my re-regulation. So if you, and this is after 29 years of having skills for this, you can think of how it used to be for me. I mean, I just went months where I could barely read a paragraph. I would read it over and over again. I was faking it. Once I was a passenger in a car and I, I had a cup of coffee, like a ceramic mug in my hand, and I can't remember what I was talking about with somebody, but what they said made me mad. And I just threw the cup out the window and the cup smashed. And I remember they pulled the car out over and they started crying. It was so upsetting to them. And I was so dysregulated that I didn't predict that that would even affect them, that I smashed a cup out the window. It was just this weird, reckless, rough thing to do. And not coincidentally, it was something that my parents used to do is like break dishes when they were upset. It was in there. So through my daily practice and through re-regulation, I've started to kind of let those old imprints of how to deal with feelings and you know, lashing out like that, that it started to be rinsed off of me and washed downstream in the experience of my life. And then a new strength comes up inside where I have some balance and some calm inside to draw on when things are rough and things get rough sometimes. Getting dysregulated at work can also cause you to sort of come off as hostile and intimidating and difficult. And <laughs> Unfortunately, if you have CPTSD and it's active and you haven't yet developed a way to sort of do a self-examination and get some support from somebody who totally cares about you, like maybe a buddy in my daily practice program or a sponsor in 12 steps, somebody you trust to sort of when you can go, is it just me? Like, should I be really angry right now? It really helps to get a second opinion from trusted people because if you're coming off as very, very difficult, even if people are obliged by law to treat you fairly, it's not fair to them that they would have to work with somebody who's causing so much anxiety. So I'm just going to ask you to look at it that way. It's very difficult to work with somebody who's leading with anger, who's leading with conflict, who's getting emotionally dysregulated on the job and sort of triggering and drawing off of the, the peaceful well that anybody else has managed to develop. The best way forward, if a job is really terrible and it makes you so angry all the time because it's a bad place for you to work, I encourage you to change jobs. Like nobody's coming to save you on this. If you want to work in a better environment, it is time for you to start putting your ducks in a row so you can make that change. And if you're choosing to stay in the environment, you may need to assess as difficult things happen, you know, wait a minute, you know, am I being mistreated here? Should I just let it go? Should I just show up and be a good sport? Like these are the improvisational decisions that we make day after day after day, especially when we're out in the world dealing with people. As you heal your dysregulation, you'll have good judgment about it. You'll have good judgment and you'll have equanimity, magnanimity. This is where you can be just sort of like, kind and easy going with people when they're edgy with you. And often you can be the one who sort of heads off a big conflict of just like, we're cool. Okay. Not being a doormat. There's, it's a fine line, isn't it? And this is where people with uh, childhood PTSD can get so jammed up is there is a conflict. Somebody's not being quite right. They're off in some way. You need to set a boundary. You want to be kind about it. You don't want to be a doormat. And this is where we get very confused. So again, I recommend daily practice to help move the stress thoughts downstream so you can have clear thoughts and lucid decisions about like what to do about the little things that happen every day. And you will be surprised what a, how quickly your life goes from a trajectory that's kind of uh, not going that well to a trajectory that is going so much better because of these little decisions along the way. The little decisions where you kind of handle it, you handle it. You're the reliable person. You're the sturdy person. You're the person with boundaries who says no to mistreatment without a big bunch of fireworks about it. It's just a boundary. I remember I used to run a video production company and I meditate every day, twice a day. And one of those meditations is somewhere around four or five in the afternoon. And when you do video production, sometimes you can't, you know, the schedule demands that you keep working quite long into the evening. But I knew, and I had the privilege because I owned the company of just like, I need to meditate or I'm going to start getting grumpy, unfocused, 
hostile, intimidating, you know, all those things. And I know that I do that and it, and it brings me back into, you know, lucidity and kind of a, a, a goodness of heart and a clear mind. And that's exactly how I want to be doing all my work always. And so I would just be like about five o'clock, I'm going to have us all take a break. I'm going to go meditate. And I set a boundary on that. And people were just like, okay, Anna has to meditate. And I had spent years missing my evening meditation when I was working because I was afraid that I couldn't ask for it or I couldn't try it. And so I just put that out there. You may not own your company right now or have that privilege, but you may be surprised that when you set boundaries in a way that's not um, trying to put any responsibility on other people, but just like going, I have this thing I need to do. It's now nine in the morning. And when it gets to be that time, I'm going to need a break to do that. So are we good? Are we good? And then maybe you need to be a little flexible about it, but you get to do the things that help you stay in the frame of mind where you can advance in your career and not just that's because I'll tell you at five o'clock, if I'm not writing and meditating and the stress of video production, if I didn't do it, I turned into the kind of person who did not get another job from the client. I'll say that. <laughs> so it became totally important that I care for myself. Anyway, it surprised me. People were very glad for me to take care of myself. And not only did they tolerate it, but they respected me for it. They started asking me, so how do you meditate? Where did you learn to do that? Like it became intriguing to them that somebody took care of themselves right in front of them. All right, a sub area again of dysregulation on the job is it makes it very hard to deal with criticism and there's just no way around it. Like if you're going to grow on the job, you have to be open to some level of people telling you how you maybe made a mistake or how you need to do it better. It can also make you vague about discussions of money. It's easy to walk into a job and go, um, so, yeah, I'd like to do the job and then be like, oh, I should have asked for how much money. I just have no idea. And if you are not somebody who can be comfortable talking about money and own what it is you require, then you are very unlikely to get what you want or deserve. And so dysregulation makes that sort of decision to be able to be honest about what it is you're looking for and not, not playing any games, but just saying, I need to be paid this much or this job isn't going to work for me. To be able to do that with peace in your heart is what re-regulation looks like. And not to be like, oh, I'm all, I'm preemptively so angry. I never get what I want. You know, oh, here we go. I'm not, oh no, I can't say anything. It's going to come out wrong. It's stupid. I don't, oh, fine. I'll just not say anything. You don't want to be that person. The other thing that you can get very vague about that can really create problems on the job and dysregulation, this is a big way that dysregulation sabotages people, is you get vague about sexual boundaries. So if you are getting sexually harassed, or let's say that a coworker and you have, you know, an attraction going and you're hanging out after work and you don't really know, like, is this a date? Is this an attraction? Is this okay at work? Um, are we going to talk about this? All that stuff. To get vague about it at work is so shooting yourself in the foot. Work is a place where you need to be very, very clear about where you're coming from and you need to be clear where other people are coming from. And I know that it is a tricky dance to be able to clarify these things, that you could really put people on the spot, you could make them feel threatened. Maybe you're not ready to do that yet. But I urge you, do not get vague about your boundaries, about sex, attraction, hanging out with people who you think maybe are hitting on you. That is some place to say, and this is where being re-regulated helps. You can just say, oh, thanks. This feels like a date. I wouldn't want to do that. You can say it in the nicest way so that if there's any hope that you can set your boundary without the other person freaking out, which is what bad people do, right? When they're confronted with boundaries, it happens at work, obviously. But if you possibly can, you set your boundaries in the nicest possible way so that you're not part of any conflict. And most people will say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's not where I was coming from. And the whole thing evaporates. Even in your personal life, if you have vague and confusing relationships with people where you're like, is this a date or is this kind of, are we flirting? Is it, are you cheating on your spouse? Like what's going on here? where you don't know, there's a magic power that you always have with you and it's honesty. When there's like magic pixie dust all over everything, like, I don't know, we're just not going to say anything about what's really going on here because it will ruin the moment or I'll feel embarrassed or then you'll know or it'll become obvious that this is not sustainable. Like those are things that we do when we have 
trauma wounds. And this is also what people do in limerence is keep it vague, keep it vague, because to have it be concrete would be to have it be something that you must say no to. It's not real. It's not legitimate. You will get rejected. So, so we keep it vague and we get too good at that. But that is the kind of thing that will bite you in the butt at work. You do not want to be vague about these things. The ideal scenario, though, is where you hold your boundaries at work. You don't get too into it with people. If you have to explain yourself, you're already losing your boundary. If you have to, you can go to your support people outside of work to process the emotions and have a cry and deal with all the feelings that come up around it. The fourth trauma zone that can come and hold back your advancement at work is the other people in your life. Um, usually it would be a partner who are just messed up enough to sabotage the impression you make at work. And that could be everything from the controlling and abusive partner at home. It could be people who continue to have drama in their own life and you get calls all the time and you have to take them to the emergency room. or. You have a home life that you invest a lot of energy into hiding from people at work, and that may be appropriate, but when it's draining your energy all the time of what's going on at home, you know, maybe you have a partner with an addiction, maybe you have a marriage that's falling apart, maybe you have a kid who's in great difficulty, and I know how complicated those situations can be, but I, I would be leaving something big out if I didn't acknowledge that having tr troubled people in your home life can sabotage you at work. So I hope you can do everything you need to do to have a little bit of separation from that. Um, coming to work with what I call an emotional hangover. You know, I never was much of a drinker, but I would get into such emotional scrapes and difficulties with people that I would come to work late with a terrible migraine, looking awful, having cried all night, eyes all puffy. And it was functionally, I had to admit, like being an alcoholic, like being an alcoholic with a hangover. And it used to happen too much because of the kinds of relationships that I had before I had trauma healing and when I still didn't know how to get re-regulated. One of the, oh gosh, it's just such a relief now in post-healing life. I, I talk about it like it's all done. I mean, so much progress. Luckily, it continues, so I don't even know where it's going next. But I wake up in the morning every day, okay. <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a great asset to being able to um, open up my heart and my life to new opportunities and things that are hard for me. Like everything that I've ever done as crappy childhood fairy, at some point it was new, like putting my first video up on YouTube. It took so much courage. And um, I'm working on a book now and I have an agent and trying to do all of that is like, again, like it takes courage. I could never do it if I had an emotional hangover as often as I used to. So that's another reason. Like so many people with complex PTSD, my early career looked a lot like a roller coaster with great accomplishments and then big descents, giving up, quitting things, crashing and burning. And it wasn't just productivity, but it had a lot to do with people who I chose as partners. And twice I ended up with, with men who had active, serious drug addictions. In both cases, I didn't realize it at first. And uh, one of them had a relapse after a couple years into the relationship. One of them had been secretly using the whole time. And it was absolutely devastating to, to my career both times. Both times my career derailed. It was very stigmatizing to me. There was no way I could continue to hide it. We're talking serious drugs and terrible consequences of what happened to them. When I started to have boundaries about who got into my life, which involved making a decision that it was okay with me if I was single forever, a single mom at that point, I'd be single forever, but I would never again have that level of drama of an active addict in my life. My career couldn't help but go up because I stopped having this crazy intense drama going on all the time. And so if you've never had a drama-free life and been able to go to work like that with your own optimism or energy, or maybe you don't like the job that day, but just to basically have your wits and your emotions in their little cubby holes <laughs> when you arrive at work, you're gonna be so pleasantly surprised how much energy and bandwidth you have that's all for you to be able to accomplish what you want. It's fantastic. That is one of the gifts of healing. All right, a fifth way, trauma area, 
that will stop you from getting ahead at work is choosing jobs and bosses who match your terrible family of origin, right? How many times have you done that? Like constantly brings out the worst in you when you do that. Like you may be able to get a lot of healing with your parent, but there's a reason why we get some distance from those toxic dynamics. And if you're not healed yet, you will have a tendency to choose bosses and coworkers and work environments that have some sort of like mimicking yuckiness about them, like what you grew up with. So for me, I would say the bosses, I, I've had some good bosses. I haven't had a boss in like 23 years, but I had clients. And one of the hardest things that I kept getting into was clients or bosses with significant drinking problems, like my mom, drugs and alcohol problems. And I get around that energy and it's like kryptonite where I feel very angry. I feel shut down. I feel very snippy. I'm not pleasant and I'm not very visionary. And it's, it ends up using up about 60% of my vital force, you know, just to cope with somebody who's high. And it's not good for me. I don't want to be around it. I, it's just one of those things I had to make a conscious decision. I will not work with people who I feel are drunk or high. And ugh, so many bad memories there. The other thing, the other negative tendency that I um, would tend to gravitate towards is bosses who really underestimated me. Now, being a consultant is nice. When you're freelancing, they think highly enough of you to employ you, and it may not last forever. You may not get a second job with them, but if it's spread out a little bit, you get to really like work on your professional skills without falling into a, a parent-child relationship with your boss. And I think there's a subtle way of doing that. I sometimes, I get letters from people or I've coached people where they're like, my boss invalidates me, you know, my boss plays favorites and I'm just like, oh, bad situation, bad situation. Sometimes I think the only thing for it is to get out of a job like that. Sometimes healing is possible, but if you're dealing with a dynamic that you grew up with and you're not very far along your, your path of healing your trauma symptoms, being around the stuff that hurt you in the first place can just really take you down. So I recommend making a conscious decision about the kind of boss and coworkers that would be good for you and seeking it out and being willing to take the time to find that. And I know, I mean, look, I started in this video telling you I had to clean houses while I was young, you know, just to get by. I, I've had all kinds of jobs that were hard and that I just had to do for money. And I know, I know it's like that, but we're all, we're all hoping for something a little better, right? We want to get onto where we feel fulfilled, where we're using our talents and gifts, where we're getting paid well enough to be financially okay. That's a very nice thing to have. It feels good to do the absolute best job you can do. And um, one way, one thing that comes as a shock to people is that when you're in a job, and you work for a boss or a company or a project, your job is to make that entity, that person, that organization, that group as successful as you can. So when you're in a, like a parent dynamic with the parent who hurt you, your objective becomes something very different than, you know, making them successful. And that may sound very self-sacrificing to you. It's not. When you make your boss successful, you rise up. If your boss doesn't recognize that that's valuable and reward you, Either it's not a place that has a, has a better place for you, or it's not a place that's willing to give that to you. And that's not a good environment. So if I had my whole career to do over again, and what I tell my coaching clients is be brave about envisioning a step forward, a step up, a step out. And if you can't get it from where you are right now, then you have to do the very triggering and dysregulating act of finding something new and quitting the old job but you can now do that without a big conflict or fireworks or rancor, that it's just a positive step that people take and it's okay and you deserve it. And when you learn to master re-regulation from your dysregulation, it becomes natural. Be sure you surround yourself with people who get it, that you have people with whom you can be honest. At first I had this in 12-step uh, programs, then I started to have it around people who had complex PTSD. And that's one thing I love about our membership program is like everybody's working on this stuff. Everybody's kind of working off the same playbook about how to do it. Everybody's hopping on Zoom together. Our members create their own Zoom calls to do the daily practice together. They have buddy relationships. Anyway, I was turning into an ad for that. But if you really wanted to be around people who are walking this path of improving their lives, 
come check it out. Uh, there's a link always down below in the description section for my membership program or on my website. So with that, I wish you well. I wish you every bit of freedom from the oppression and suppression of the past, what people did to you, and the ways that you've held yourself back since then too. So that the best in you, so that everything you're capable of can come forward and shine. It's not just because that's what will make you happy. It's because we need you. The world depends on all of us becoming our full and real selves and to be able to bring our best to everything we do.